Good morning, everyone. It's not my role to welcome you, so I'm going to leave that to my colleague Luanda, seated on my my far left. My name is Alex Benkenstein. I'm from the South African Institute of International Affairs. I just briefly wanted to apologize for the late start. We were just sorting out some technical issues. Uh, that all seems to be resolved. And I just wanted to give a very brief overview of how we're going to be structuring the day. Um, as I said in a moment, I'm going to pass the word to my colleague Luanda Mapogosi. We're also going to have Claudia Mitrano here on my left um, for the welcome. Then we'll be receiving, receiving, hello, audio? Seem to have lost audio. Shall we try that one? It's working. All right, so um, after that, we're going to be hearing from uh, Lilium Chagas, Director of the Department for Climate in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I will then also step in for some opening remarks. We're going to be hearing from Juliana Luis um, from the T T20 Task Force for Task Force 2, that is most aligned with our discussions today. We're going to be then handing the mic back to uh, Luanda to review the Global South Network, and you'll get more information in her introductory remarks to position this event in that context. Uh, we do then hope we will watch time, but we hope then to be joined by Anna Tony, Secretary for Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment, um, and that will then feed into the two main discussion sessions uh, we're going to have a two-hour session dealing with a uh, working group for the Global South Network on loss and damage and a work on uh, a, a, a two-hour session on, on green technology after which we close. So we will run through that program. We hope to have our first discussion session uh, just preceding lunch and then lunch. After lunch, we'll have the second discussion and wrap up. So that's just to give you a little sense of the program. But as I said... This is not the official welcome. For that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Luanda. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Bon dia, hola, saudações. <laughs> and that is about all the Portuguese I can muster up this morning. <laughs> my name is Luanda Mpongose. I'm the Outreach and Partnerships Manager at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Uh, before the official, official welcoming, I have to first begin by thanking our partners, IPEA, for hosting us in this beautiful room this morning. It has been an honor to be co-hosting this uh, event together with you. So I'll just uh, acknowledge some of our speakers, um, Liliam Chagas, Director of the Department of Climate Change, Juliana Luis, representative from the T20 Task Force 2, Anna Tony, in her absence, she will be joining us a little bit later, Secretary for Climate Change and the Ministry of Environmental Affairs. I'd like to acknowledge the Global South Climate Network. We are joined by two of our co-chairs this morning. We have Dr. Nagesh Kumar, as, as well as Dr. Jorge Shedik. We also have joining us online uh, Dr. Abla Adel Latif, as well as Dr. Karim Ainawi. So we acknowledge them, we acknowledge the authors of this uh, network that we have, to acknowledge all of you in the room as well as our participants joining us online. Again, it really has been an honor to put this together together with uh, IPEA and uh, having this particularly as a T20 uh, uh, side event. Um, over the next two days, we will discuss areas that are of great importance to our institutions, to the Global South, to the G20 and to the T20 uh, Secretariat um, hosted in Brazil. Um, and the core focus of the discussion today and over tomorrow as well is really about climate change and the just transition from the context of the Global South and from the context of South Africa and, and, and Brazil. We will today be looking predominantly at green slash renewable technology as well as loss and damage, which are uh, key areas that really uh, uh, um, are aligned with Task Force 2 of the, of the T20. 
What we hope to be able to, to do today um, is to share some of the work that we've undertaken in the Global South Climate Network, which has two working groups, namely uh, Green Technology and Loss and Damage. We have authors that will present some of the arguments on these uh, issues. We hope to then, from the broader discussion, be able to take some feedback to refine some of those outputs. Uh, but more importantly as well, we hope to be able to shape the discussion today to be able to make some submissions uh, on recommendations to the Task Force 2 of the T20 Secretariat. Um, so um, on a logistical note, uh, today's sessions will be made in English. We do not have interpretation, so we hope that everybody will be able to follow along. And with that, thank you very much for being with us. We welcome you, and we wish you very fruitful deliberations. I'll hand over then to, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Luanda, and uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm just, uh, first of all, uh, welcome you all. It's a great, great pleasure for IPEA to have you here to co-host the, the seminar uh, with Saya. Uh, I, I'm not going to go deep in these questions, in these issues. We will have uh, the whole seminar for this. But I, I would like to just to point out that uh, Climate change and just transi transition uh, has become something paramount in the IPEA's agenda. And because we recognize, as you, uh, that climate change is uh, a great challenge for, for, for the world, but especially for the global south. So uh, we have been uh, discussing with uh, the government uh, uh, many issues and studies and policies about adaptation and mitigation in the global south. And uh, it's something that we think with our partners here in South Africa, India, and uh, all the, 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 the global south, we can uh, put forward some proposals for the global north <laughs> to discuss this, these issues. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to, to give you this welcome on behalf of our president, Luciana Servo, who could not be here today. So uh, uh, with, with that, I I'm give you the word to, to Alex to, to, to go further. Thank you very much and be very welcome for this seminar. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yes, from my side as well, I think just in these uh, in this opening session, maybe to to frame this discussion, you've already heard from uh, Luanda the work that's been done in terms of facilitating a network of southern voices on these issues. Um, that ties very much in with the with the core values, I would say, of, of SAI, the South African Institute of International Affairs, as a primarily an African think tank, but very much positioned within the Global South discourse. Um, that's been a key part of the Institute's identity, and I think the discussions we can have today and the sort of discussions we can facilitate on an ongoing basis, because of course, as you may have gathered from those introductory remarks, this is not a once-off event. This is part of an ongoing process. Um, the network has met on several past occasions and will meet into the future. There are publications emerging from the network, and we're going to be working together not only to refine those, but also to think about the channels that we can access for impact and how we assist each other, really, in amplifying the um, a southern voice on these issues. We know the Global South has been historically marginalized uh, in, we can say, global climate policy making generally, but we see that reflected also in climate and just transition debates. And we know there's, there's an external and there's, there's structural dimensions to that, but there are also internal dimensions that require a bit of, of, of self-reflection. Um, it's very true to say, and I think most of us participating here today uh, would not disagree that there is incredible uh, expertise, there are incredible insights from leading thinkers in the global south, and they are in 
civil society organizations, think tanks, they are uh, in government bodies, government uh, research institutes. Um, but perhaps it is accurate to say or fair to say that the one area where we sometimes fall short is perhaps just that, that depth. And if you, you see that sometimes reflected in, you know, the size of the delegations uh, when, we, when we go to COPs and when we're engaging in other, 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 other international fora. Um, and and that, that lack of depth has certain implications for how we work together. It means that um, if we're very serious about amplifying that Global South voice, about getting the message across, we have to work collaboratively. Um, not only through this network, of course, there are multiple fora that seek to bring together uh, and inject southern perspectives into global policy processes, but this is one forum where we hope to convene and, and contribute that role. Um, and also allows us to address those structural issues that have historically marginalized the southern voice within global policy processes. So it's not only the content issues, the technical issues that we're trying to advance, but also through these sorts of interventions, consider those structural constraints and look for opportunities where that can be shifted. Um, it's a basic principle that the regions most affected by climate change should have the strongest, the loudest voice within setting the rules of the game. But we know that that's not the reality. Um, and those rules of the game are shifting very rapidly, whether we're looking at uh, regulations around green technology and technology transfer, global green tech value chains, uh, structures and processes around loss and damage and financing, uh, climate and trade. There's a whole plethora of issues, but this is a very dynamic area, very rapidly shifting, which again just underscores the, the importance of, of getting our messaging right and making sure that we, we are heard. Um, also recognizing that coordination is not always going to mean consensus. We know that it's very easy to refer to the Global South as this kind of unified concept um, but there's an immense diversity within the Global South. Um, ideological orientations, administrations, there's uh, socio-economic development priority areas. So immense diversity. And I think that's also something that we need to acknowledge and then engage and see where those differences exist. How can we still work together collaboratively to drive the agenda forward? Um, We'll be hearing in a moment from the T20 Secretariat. Uh, I think that this moment is also incredibly important for us. Um, of course, South Africa will be, uh, will be uh, hosting the T20 uh, or the G20 process next year. Uh, this year already we've very, been very engaged and even last year's uh, Indian presidency. Um, next year will be the last in a series of southern G20 presidencies. Um, after South Africa into 2026, it'll, presidency will move on to the US. Um, and this moment um, where we've moved from the Indian presidency into the Brazilian presidency and next year into the South African presidency is, is such a crucial historical moment to consolidate that southern messaging also within G20 and T20 processes. Remembering that next year when South Africa uh, hosts the G20, we're also going to have here in Brazil COP30. Um, so it is, it's really a crucial moment here to think about what can be achieved, what messaging we want to achieve. Uh, of course, our immediate concern is this year with the G20 uh, Brazilian presidency, but also thinking very carefully about how, how, we, how we partner and how we maintain continuity in our messaging between uh, this series of, of Global South uh, presidencies. With that, I just want to check 
uh, confirm online, do we have Lilium Chagas with us? Will we be able to project her on the screen? Lilium, are you able to, um, are you hearing us? Okay, we're not we're not getting your audio in the room just yet. Just try again for us. So I'm sorry, we're we're not getting your audio in the room. Yes, it's very faint, but you can try to proceed. comprises 134 30, uh, four countries. It means that two-thirds of the whole, uh, the whole constituency of the, the UNFCCC uh, belongs to this negotiating group. So whenever, whenever this group, the G77, um, agrees on something, that idea, that concept, that decision will go forward, you know, because of the number of countries involved. It's a very, very powerful influence. But again, as, as our, our speaker just said, it's a, it's a group of 134 countries with a high diversity within them. We have differences within the global south. It's normal. No, the countries are different in their, in their uh, size, economic uh, model, priorities, stage of development. So it's very normal. But uh, if we, the G77 manages to agree on something, and as I understand that was the case for the loss and damage fund in the Sharm el Sheikh it's, it's very, very difficult, difficult to, 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 to put to down, down this idea, idea you know? so, so it's a powerful, powerful group that, that uh, works, works together, together. there are lots, lots of coordination, and uh, whenever, whenever our interests converge, converge within, within the, the, the negotiations, negotiations it's, it's a, a really, really powerful position. position. And uh, my, my opinion is that, that we should keep trying you know, to, to achieve common positions within the G77 and, and get some, some decisions more uh, development-oriented. So this is uh, my first comment, you know, the structure of the negotiation, which are equal and uh, very much EU-centric. 
because not only in terms of countries, but in terms of international agencies that uh, produce uh, concepts and papers and data, and that they are all, uh, most of them are located you know, in European and uh, in North America. Uh, the second uh, uh, inequality would be, or the second challenge for, for developing countries is uh, the concept of ambition. You know, ambition for, for the rich ones, it means mitigation. You know, countries have to reduce, must reduce their emissions of, uh, uh, of green gases uh, that produce global warming. And then we have only this, this lag of the regime uh, being, uh, being uh, uh, stimulated. And uh, for most developing countries, the, the main need is finance. How governments, how countries can uh, finance their uh, transition for a low carbon economy uh, in, in reasonable ways. So finance is a major gap. And, uh, but we, the, the regime, the, 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 the structure of the negotiations, they are um, focused on mitigation. So this, this competition between uh, mitigation and finance, it, uh, it uh, hijacks the discussion and uh, sometimes, you know, um, prevents us to go forward in a, in a, in a more fast way than what, what, is, what is needed at this time of history. So uh, one of the, 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 the the concept that the Troika of Presidents, uh, COP President Troika, that means um, the, United, the, the Emirates, United Emirates, uh, Azerbaijan and Brazil, one concept that we are, we are pushing nowadays is the concept of reframing ambition. You know, the, the pillar of finance is how to finance uh, climate action. It should be in the front line. It should be uh, our priority you know, at this point. So uh, reframing ambition is one of the challenges that we face uh, now. Uh, the third uh, comment I would like to make, it's um, between the three pillars of the international regime to combat, to tackle climate change, that, that are uh, mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation. By far, what is lacking, the pillar that has uh, been lacking behind is the third one, is means of implementation, financing, transfer of technology, capacity building. So from a South perspective, uh, means of implementation should be put forward. Um, another another uh, challenge that we face that uh, uh, is um, sort of um, polemic, but I wanted to, to bring it up to, to have some discussions on it, is the, the, the questioning of some countries, some countries, the developed countries, uh, the questioning of uh, basic uh, principles of the regime. The principle of uh, CBDR, the common but differentiated responsibilities, the, the concept of historical responsibilities, the commitments that developed countries have made within the, 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 the agreements and that they, they didn't deliver. You know, not only the, the 100 uh, uh, billion per year that should be flowing since uh, 2020, and they did not flow in the scale that was was uh, committed. Um, so uh, these principles, they, they they sometimes they are questioned, and uh, it's our interest that they 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 are they should be reinforced. No, there is this this attention around these basic principles. And uh, lastly, that the challenge. Yes? Interrupting you. Lower your speaker because there are there is some echo here. Okay. 
No, no problem. Thank you. So my last point uh, of uh, the, ch the list of challenges for the Global South is that um, we have to, to make sure that the fight against climate change uh, does not, must not widen the inequality gap. You know, because as, as you know, as the, the information that we all have, all receive, uh, most of the investments on clean energy, uh, they go to the global north or to developed countries. You know, the, the green transition that is needed to tackle climate change, it, uh, it's going much faster in a bigger scale in countries that um, have the resource, the resources to do this, to, to, to fund their own transitions. You know, the international money that should be flowing, uh, uh, it's, it's much, much harder, harder the, or it's, it's not, not available, available or, or it's, it's very hard, hard to access. access. Um, so so the, the, the challenge is that, that uh, in, 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 in fighting climate, climate change, change, in positioning towards a, a low car carbon future, future the, 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 the final, final result, result should not be a widening wide wide of the inequality gap. Um, I will stop here. I, I, will, I will be happy to, to, to comment or, or to be back to answer questions, whatever um, you need. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a very interesting seminar, and um, I will be following these discussions uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we did we did have a little bit of problem with the audio, but we did manage to follow you in the room. And now there's some problem with my audio. Right, so I don't sound like I'm in a rock concert anymore. Um, all right, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chagas, for, for uh, your remarks. I'm not going to uh, comment on them too much. I think it, it's very much aligned with, with that framework. Uh, some of the issues you raised, uh, raised around uh, the imbalance of focus um, on mitigation, um, not uh, looking at the at the three pull, pillars of adaptation and loss and damage the financing and i think uh very aptly also where you refer to the green technology value chains and that dimension of um ties in a little bit to what i was saying of the rules of the game changing it's also the centers and the levers of of uh, economic competition and innovation is is shifting um and that means even further impetus for uh, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, uh, and collaboration. We're running a little bit behind, so I'm going to hand directly over to Juliana Luiz, uh, who is uh, going to be giving us a bit of an overview of the Brazilian uh, T20 uh, Task Force 2 specifically, which, as I said, would be our primary audience for recommendations emerging from this workshop. And to excuse uh, Sorry, Claudio. Sorry, but I have to leave, and, but I hope that you have a great seminar today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, Alex, and everyone. Bye-bye. Very good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, Actually, you mentioned that uh, the, about the noise. I was I was connecting to like a spaceship. I think we were like in another planet. So this is kind of a relevant discussion to bring discussion to Earth, right? Uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, say thank you uh, to the South African Institute of International Affairs uh, for the invitation. It is a great, great pleasure of being here today. My name is Juliana Luiz. I act as a project manager at Instituto Escolhas, which is a Brazilian think tank that develops analysis and studies on a broad issues ranging from mining and land use, food systems, among other issues, including energy. Uh, and we also use this data and evidence-based research to do a strong advocacy work. Um, I'm here with the hard task to represent 
Task Force 2. Um, so first of all, I must say that Task Force 2, so-called sustainable climate action and inclusive just energy transition, is composed by more than 20 organizations. So the main uh, insights and comments and analysis not necessarily reflect the opinions of the entire organizations, but I will try, I will try to stick to uh, our shared information in here. Uh, it's in here, great. Well, I think everybody already knows, so um, I'm just um, making some statements about how T20 is currently structured. We have six task forces ranging from several issues. Important to say that those task forces, they have many alignments and connecting points between them. Uh, and this, this is not only because that several topics, they, they resonate among each other, but also to reflect some of the Brazil's D20 presidency priorities. Uh, there are three priorities. Uh, the first one is combating hunger, poverty, and inequality, which is pretty much um, clearly seen in Task Force One. Uh, the second priority is promoting sustainable development across socioeconomic and environmental pillars. This is clearly resonated in the Task Force Two, but also it goes across the other task forces as well. And last but not least, there is a third priority, which is fostering global governance reform, uh, clearly uh, seen in um, Task Force 6, which is strengthening multilateralism and global governance. Well, um, how Task Force 2 is structured? Uh, it's so-called sustainable climate action. Obrigada sustainable climate action and inclusive just energy transition. And it was built on the very clear context. The context is that the world is, fall is falling short in achieving sustainable developing goals and Paris Agreement targets. Um, and due to the recent stock take, both on SDGs uh, and on uh, UNFCCC, uh, highlighted the, the, the gaps on achieving those goals. And great part of the challenge is rooted in financial issues. Uh, the finance gap was clearly stated by Lillian and also by the other ones in here. So um, T20 is really uh, discussing the finance gap. It's uh, a relevant issue uh, passing through all of the task forces. The main objective of Task Force 2 is to address critical facets of climate action with a particular emphasis on issues related to energy transition. So energy transition is quite relevant for this task force. Uh, and, but it has a central focus on inclusivity and justice. Uh, so what are the goals and what are the, the efforts that organizations, think tanks, members are willing to achieve by uh, designing policy briefs, issue notes, uh, presenting uh, all the, the statements for uh, policy makers and decision makers. It hopes that uh, whatever it comes together, it, uh, it will be used by G20 members to lead by example. Uh, also help to pave the way to support renewable energies and a just transition. And lastly, but not uh, for, by far less important, is perhaps uh, with the recommendations and input uh, collected by the group to raise the debate for critical upcoming moments. So I, I highlight COP29, uh, which will bring negotiations of the new collective quantify go on finance, but also uh, COP30 in Brazil, for discussing the new NDCs. Um, the task force two is composed by, as I said, several organizations. The co-leads are Plata Pharmacipo and Idri. And co-chairing and acting as members, we have uh, the South African Institute of International Affairs hosting this event, and also Institute Escolhas, represented by myself. 
but also other organizations uh, acting as co-chairs and members. As you can see, we have quite subtopics. Um, so they, they are seven subtopics. Most of them are connected between uh, each other. They, they have strong um, uh, connections and they dialogue a lot, uh, not only due to the finance gap, but other aspects um, related to Brazil's priorities, such as combating hunger and poverty and reforming global governance. Uh, in the first round, the task force received more than 200 abstracts, and now we have around we have uh, 110 policy briefs under evaluation. What is the scope for the subtopics? Well, subtopic one, uh, so-called as fostering sustainable, inclusive, and just energy transition. Uh, it has as its main goal to develop policy proposals to ensure that uh, the necessary shift towards sustainable energy is inclusive and fair for all. So one of the key messages that uh, the subtopic one wants to raise is that energy transition must be justice oriented. It also needs to mitigate the adverse impacts that just transition will cause. Uh, there is another interesting aspect in the concept note regarding subtopic one is that uh, a very much needed in-country capacity uh, must be put together for energy transition planning and implementation. Uh, among the accepted policy briefs, it was interesting to see that the messages are uh, pretty much aligned. For instance, there are several uh, policy briefs that will raise the issue on energy transition that must be people-centered such as guaranteeing public participation, gender inclusivity, and fairness uh, through the, the just transition process. Uh, but subtopic two, uh, called as accelerating transition to a low carbon economy and sustainable consumption and production, uh, how it uh, mirrors the debate and amplifies the debate of subtopic one. Uh, its main topic is to accelerate the shift towards sustainable consumption and production to promote social and economic development. Um, it has a clear statement that uh, in comparison to subtopic one, which is clearly narrowed, nar narrowed the debate on just energy transition, it, it says clearly that the just transition must occur in all sectors. So we are uh, amplifying the debate to other sectors as well to include how we can transition away from unsustainable practices. Uh, it is all clearly stated that economic development with, must occur without harming people, planet, and climate. The expansion of the just transition discussion is interesting. It, it, it was also reflected in the policy briefs. For instance, there are um, research-based analysis on just transition for other sectors, such as agriculture, food systems, and bioeconomy. The subtopic three, which is called um, fostering investments and open innovation for social bioeconomy and nature-based solutions, has at its main goals to foster a shared understanding of the concepts of a social bioeconomy and nature-based solutions. This is the first time that uh, subtopics such as this pretty much uh, narrowed into the debate on bioeconomy it's posed in T20. This is a reflection of a new initiative also uh, uh, developed by Brazil, which is the G20, Brazil's G20 Bioeconomy Initiative. And it has three clear goals. Uh, first is the need for scaling up investments for research, development, and innovation. Second is the need to, for sharing case studies and really practical ways for realizing a sustainable use of biodiversity. And the third one is the need to scale up financial and market mechanisms that guarantees the rights of local populations. Once again, um, policy briefs accepted. Um, they, are, they seem to be quite aligned with the messages 
that the subtopic wants to raise, as for instance, there are some policy briefs discussing research, develop, and in the, in innovation under the dimension of social and community-based innovations. Well, um, subtopic four, uh, which is called as investing in sustainable, inclusive, and resilient infrastructure, uh, has as it main, it, its uh, main objective to identify ways to foster infrastructure investment, infrastructure investments that promote inclusivity, resilience, and sustainability. Uh, key messages around the subtopic includes uh, that infrastructure investments must support just transition processes. This is quite relevant for infrastructure considered uh, that those investments used to, usually are quite uh, from a long term and they can really generate lock-ins in the process. So it's like a critical uh, discussion about just transition as a whole from all sectors to bring an infrastructure into this perspective. Uh, so in another topic, another um, framework that's quite interesting for the subtopic is that investments on this, in this realm must be carried out with resilience and adaptation lenses. Perhaps, um, and last, lastly, uh, that infrastructure needs to be designed to foster climate resilient cities. Uh, among the subtopics, perhaps this is the one that most resonate uh, the debate on adaptation and resilience um, because it was really, um, it was structured as, as it is, of course, other subtopics and the task force uh, as a whole, uh, it poses this issue, but it was quite stated uh, into the concept note and also it is reflected in the policy briefs. Um, for instance, there are quite, um, quite wide range of policy briefs uh, bring the issue of resilience and adaptation approach for infrastructure at the city level. Oops. Not working. Can someone change for me, please? Yeah. Uh, so topic five, which is called let's optimizing access to multilateral and climate funds and le leveraging private capital for climate finance has as its main uh, objective to identify ways to scale up climate finance, including through better access to multilateral and climate funds and great private sector investments. Uh, as I mentioned before, the finance gap is clearly posed in this one, but once again, it's a matter of this uh, relevant discussion uh, among all the, all the subtopics. Key message around subtopic five is that there, it, once it, it has the concept note and the, the work, work uh, uh, built uh, around subtopic five has a more clear emphasis on energy transition so can be pretty much aligned with the other subtopics that has a focus on energy transition. Uh, and it has other two uh, relevant messages. One of them is that a catalytic, a catalytic role can be played by developed banks, national, regional, multilateral developed banks, and also, also by climate funds. And lastly, that uh, those funds must ensure, must be, uh, um, um, help must be ensured for um, emerging and developing countries, global south countries in general. Uh, uh, um, among the policy briefs accepted, there are clear uh, messages around ensuring resources and investments for developing countries. Subtopic so six, which is opera, opera, operationalizing climate justice through financing and technology transfer, has as its main objective to propose concrete ways to operationalize climate justice between and within countries. The key messages, the focus of the subtopic six, 
is the need for a fair and equitable access of finance for developing countries and also poses the issue of technology transfer and co-develop that must be uh, the t technology co-development that must be facilitated. It was interesting to see among the policy briefs accepted uh, not only proposals around technology transfers, but also the issue of building afford affordable technologies. So it's something, um, not, once again, there's also relevant issues around leveraging loss and damage finance and climate adjusted finance, um, but really resonates with the message of subtopic six. And lastly, we have subtopic seven, which is called as implementing just sustainability, reporting requirements, the role of SDG metrics, its, high, its main objectives is to highlight approaches and practices that foster transparency, accountability, and standardization concerning companies, environmental, social, and governance metrics, and taxonomies. Uh, among the, the, it, it, the key messages of subtopic seven, it is the need that reporting requ requirements must work for all. This includes small and medium enterprises and developing countries. Another in, in interesting feature of the subtopic is that uh, the lesson learned during the process should, should and must support international standards. Uh, among the, um, the policy briefs accepted, there are well, really uh, connected a, uh, debate and also uh, an interesting discussion on how to integrate the di biodiversity and social inclusion on taxonomies. Uh, to conclude my presentation and trying to stick on time, um, we have one of the uh, one challenging during this two days event is to discuss how to strengthen Southern voices on the climate and just transition agenda. And I did a quick um, research on our past T20 and trying to see and find task forces from uh, Global South countries that was discussing just transition. And uh, since Indonesia, we have clear state forces, uh, task forces, resonating the issue of just an energy transition. For instance, in Indonesia, the task force governing climate target, energy transition, and environmental protection posed into its final note uh, among several actual points and policy recommendations, the need to promote regional analysis to identify regions of specific opportunities and challenges. This is very interesting to this, for a discussion from the Global South and how to scale up regional um, coordination, cooperation, good practices, and uh, lessons learned. And the same is seen in Task Force uh, of India called Refueling Growth, Clean Energy and Green Transitions. Once again, it has a clear um, focus on just energy transition, uh, but it, it also on its final note uh, raised the issue that for encouraging existing and newer formats of cooperation. This is a reflection of how uh, Global South uh, frameworks and current uh, uh, structures could be uh, foment and supported and amplified and best seen as I'll expose it in the, in the beginning. Um, and now we are on T20 Brazil. Uh, just energy, just transition as a whole and just energy transition more uh, specifically are being this clearly discussed in task force that I'm here representing about sustainable climate action and inclusive energy transition. Interesting to see in the con on the concept note that it, as I mentioned before, but I'm here, here affirming here, that this just transition, it has to be, as it has to have a central focus on inclusivity and justice. And with this, um, with this historical pathway from 2022 until now, and for building discussions on for 2025, 
I, I brought uh, three uh, provocative questions. Uh, the first one is, what are the key lessons on just transition shared since 2022? Uh, we are here working to strengthen Southern voices on the climate and just transition agendas. What were the groups and, and think tanks and organizations that were raising the issue based from a Global South perspective since then? A second provocative question is, what should be triggered now in 2024 to build momentum for next year? Uh, it's quite clear to see how a momento was being raised since 2022. So it, it's a good moment to reflect uh, not only if I put on our final note, but also for uh, raising the issue for 2025. And lastly, uh, the, the last question is how to t uh, T20 South Africa should approach the just transition issue in 2025, not only based on my previous questions, but also uh, reflecting the momentum, reflecting uh, COP30, raising the issue of the financing gap and, uh, and the, the lessons learned not only from past T20s, but also from the climate network that's been um, uh, built up in here. Well, I'm sorry about being such a, a, a rush, uh, but I was trying to stick into my time. I thank you all. And well, I'm glad to answer questions and doubts during the process. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, I do want to acknowledge that we have uh, Ms. Anna Tony with us, Secretary for Climate Change at the Minister of Environment. Thank you very much for joining us. If your time is not too limited, I might ask Luanda to just provide some context again on the process for us, and then we'll hand over to you to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, and I'll try to be a bit brief. Um, I think um, the necessity of enhancing the Global South voices really has been articulated by previous speakers. Um, Lilium Changas spoke to the fact that uh, there's just a very unequal system at the moment, very skewed against uh, the Global South. We've heard from the T20 Task Force 2 as well. Uh, why it was necessary to develop some topics specifically trying to enhance uh, the voice of the Global South. Um, as the South African Institute of International Affairs, through our engagements in global uh, forums and platforms, we realized that uh, there needed to be uh, uh, an organized and coordinated structure or platform for, globals, for the Global South to be able to, one, increase scholarship on the voices of those regions on issues of climate change, and we recognize that scholarship really didn't have, and Alex mentioned this earlier, a depth of knowledge and engagement and coordination of the Global South when it comes to climate change, economic and energy transitions, as well as issues of development. So we've initiated this uh, network, which forms part of a project that runs for about 12 months that we do hope to, 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 to kind of kind of continue pushing because we recognized really the importance of organizing as the Global South. Um, but it really is about you know, uh, organizing Asia, Africa, and Latin America to really come together to have discussions, to have dialogue, but also have written outputs. Uh, because if you look at the research that's coming out on these topics, it's mostly research coming from the global north, and that is, uh, it, it's not in order. The network enjoys representation from organizations from these regions. We have about 44 to 45 organizations represented in total. Um, while SIA has a secretariat function, we actually have coaches who are responsible for really driving this process from a very technical and strategic uh, point of view. We have coaches representing us from across all uh, um, the three regions. 
Um, we have two of our coaches again joining us in person here today and we'll hear from them uh, as they run the sessions that will come after. And then we have some of our coaches joining us online. But it was important for SIA to not have a sole kind of role as an organization in this process, but really drive this together with other organiza like-minded organizations. So what are the objectives of this network? We've we formed it, it's represent, it has representation from the key regions of the South. So what is it that we're trying to do here with the, with the, with the network? First of all, we want to bring uh, Southern think tanks to provide thought leadership on issues of climate and the energy transition. We want to increase the prominence of Global South perspectives in debates on climate change, energy and economic uh, transitions, as well as development. We want to promote research uh, from the Global South on these issues, as well as to magnify the growing agency of developing countries um, in global debates and forums. So this is a, a vehicle through which we want to, to do this by hosting this engagement. We hope to engage, to be able to come out with something fruitful uh, uh, that we can kind of advance as, as the Global South. We also try to do this with uh, written outputs and we'll hear from authors who have authored some of the papers that will emerge uh, from this network, but we also want to uh, kind of coordinate and really engage in existing structures, and I think the T20 Brazil is one, but a very important vehicle to be able to do that. So in summary, that is what the Global South Climate Network is, and we look forward to engaging with you further um, about the work that we are undertaking in this network. So Alex, I hope I kept it short. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Luanda. All right. And... Um, now I'm going to very quickly hand over the word to Ms. Anatoni, Secretary for Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment. We're very honored that you could uh, join us today um, and we, we look forward to hearing from you, certainly. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, very recently I was there, so it's nice. <laughs> now I am in the government and, and obviously I'm seeing George as well, how, how are you? So it's a pleasure, I think the T20 is a key component of G20, has always been, uh, has been a huge influence, the T20 on the G20 and beyond, and especially on the South-South collaboration. So for me it was important to come and um, now listen what you guys are doing and, and tell a little bit what we have been doing uh, on the task force on climate change. So as, as you probably know, this task force is something new that the Brazilian presidency brought. Uh, for the first time, we bring in together the financial track uh, with the, um, the shepherd's track that has not happened before and President Lula under his leadership he set up those two task force uh, climate and poverty and I think that represents a little bit the vision of President Lula on those two key pillars which is not only important for G20 but especially for the Brazilian uh, government as well the climate change and poverty have become a cross-cutting issue within the Brazilian government uh, we have 18 ministries dealing with climate change. We have a, a committee, a climate change interministerial committee that is responsible for putting together the Brazilian climate plan. Uh, and I think that that vision of ha having an interministerial, you now very large committee with 18 ministries uh, that is uh, going to put together the climate plan both for mitigation and adaptation is that uh, brought the vision for the, what we expected on G20 as well, which is really uh, mainstreaming climate into development. That's what I think most of our countries in the South are already doing. We don't have climate, we can't even have climate as a, a little box on the corner anymore because the consequences of climate change is already with us and we have been obliged to either adapt or to deal with loss and damage or obviously thinking about a new model of development by mainstreaming also mitigation into our development plans. So the G20 uh, task force had as a premise 
that uh, ambitious climate change means uh, combining ambitions in terms of mitigation targets that all of us will need to be presenting our new NDC in 2025, together with ambitious means of implementation and therefore finance. So I think f for us, reframing ambition is quite important in, in a way that is, is no good if you only have ambitious targets that you're not able to implement, that you need ambitious target, yes, we do need, and at the same time, we do need ambitious means of implementation. Therefore, we set up, um, as, as an idea, we probably, and we just had the meeting last Thursday and Friday, we just finished the task force meeting, it was around 35 countries, it was a really interesting meeting because I think for the first time in um, G20, uh, we had many, uh, people from the ministries of environment or, uh, or energy, uh, ministers from foreign affairs, uh, ministers of finance and central banks. So we really brought together this uh, idea of mainstreaming both uh, development through, through the lenses of climate and, and finance. And we had two types, uh, we are proposing two types of uh, outcomes. The first one we're calling resetting action, and the second one we're calling resetting finance. On the resetting action, the idea was that uh, if we wanted to speed up uh, the process of mainstreaming climate in development, we cannot go any longer project by project. We need to think about country platforms, long-term country platforms that have planning in terms of development in different sectors, um, energy, agriculture, infrastructure, and from there we will um, take it out what country programs. We debated quite a bit what is country programs, and I know we have friends from um, South Africa that has experienced uh, jet peas in Indonesia, and uh, so the, 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 the energy transition side, I think, has already experiment good and bad, uh, with jet peas. Uh, it's a learning process on the jet peas. So how can we learn from uh, what has been done on country platforms and jet peas on energy mainly to other sectors, to other areas like agriculture, like adaptation, like you know, transportation. So th uh, that was the proposal. Uh, we know that both jet peas and country platforms has been a tool used mainly by financial institutions, multilateral financial institutions to organize themselves. And we feel if that is to work, it has to be bottom up. It has to be with country ownership. It has to be done together with development you know, ideas. It has to be in a just manner, thinking about employment, thinking about uh, people that is going to be affected by those programs. So rather than thinking top down, the idea of the resetting action is as I said, mainstreaming uh, climate under the development programs, creating country platforms, can then uh, go to uh, see which type of finance is there to support those actions. Uh, in relation to the resetting finance, is the other side of that, is uh, if countries are thinking about mainstreaming climate on adaptation climate and development all together, Again, where's the money going to come from? We know that the debate at UNFCCC has been dominated by the 100 billion that has not been fulfilled by the developed countries. We know that, uh, and I think we will continue that, especially now uh, for COP29 on the new number that may be agreed. But we also know that 100 billion or 120 or 150, God knows which number we're going to get there, is not going to be enough. We know that we need to align all types of finance uh, to deal with climate uh, in a way that um, both nationally and internationally, both uh, public and private. So we start having a dialogue of 
actions that the G20 may agree, some instruments that will help to flow those resources, uh, from, especially from the north to the south. Some of them have already been, you know, I think, discussed in many other places, the debt, so the debt the environmental swapped, uh, how you diminish the, <coughs> the, uh, the cost of investment, uh, obviously blended finance, but understanding that blended finance has its limits. So I think we had the chance to go through a range of uh, a menu of instruments that can perhaps uh, start helping. Uh, it was the first time that we brought environment and finance and central bank uh, people together. So you can imagine uh, that uh, for it took us a while to, you know, to decide and see exactly how we would work together on this G20. But I'm really pleased to, to see that at the end of, I think, last week on Friday, I think we have a, a quite clear path now to work on. So I think the outcomes are much more structured uh, and hopefully this task force will help uh, showing the way, showing the way uh, on how to, you know, to bring together finance and climate ambition to be in the same place. And, and if it's successful, perhaps South Africa, when you have your G20 next year, you may want it to continue uh, with the task force. Let us see if the Brazilian task force will be successful. We'll be open, obviously, for questions, but already thanking IPEA and, uh, and obviously the T20, I think is really, really important to have this dialogue, especially South-South, because um, if we are going to be able to implement what we are calling in Brazil Mission 1.5, which is to keep 1.5 alive, will depend very much uh, on the leadership of um, developing countries uh, and in all its aspects of climate, not only mitigation, but also adaptation. We know the ones that are most suffering will be in the south. The most vulnerable people are in the south. So we needed to make sure that that works. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Those were really wonderful remarks. Um, I think there's a there's a clear continuity, um, and Juliana, we're also not going to forget the questions you posed to us. Um, a continuity also between some of the themes emerging now in these latest interventions, and um, <clears throat> also the second day uh, tomorrow when we're going to be convening, because that opportunity is going to allow us to really dive deeper into. Um, South Africa's experience on the just transition, um, emerging thinking around Brazil's just transition, um, but not only questioning what those two countries can learn from each other, but also in terms of two very important global South actors, what messaging and what impact it can and should they be having in terms of these agendas. So that just transition theme is going to come through very strongly um, tomorrow. Uh, today, the, the, the sessions that we will go into, as you've heard, is primarily focused around loss and damage and green technology. We'll move into those in a moment. We're looking pretty good on time, so we have this wonderful opportunity. If there's one or two questions, perhaps, um, then we can, we can take those. I will ask my colleague Luanda or someone on the team who has access to see if there are online questions from our audience. Uh, maybe our technical team at the back, but I did see a hand. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Uh, my name is Pedro. I'm a director at the Brazilian Center for International Relations. And my question is uh, regarding continuity, but uh, not only between T20s and G20s, but considering also COP30 uh, next year. Uh, how do you and your team feel that Brazil and the Global South as a whole will be able to, you know, leverage or take advantage of these climate finance discussions that we're putting together right now during the G20 uh, when the time comes for us to discuss that in Berlin? I know that, for instance, uh, the Glasgow COP 
somehow it people were saying it was ki kind of a a climate finance cop somehow the financial sector woke up to the opportunity and the challenge of climate change back then do you feel that um maybe these two years in brazil might also be an opportunity to take a step further in that direction let's just check uh, is there someone on the technical team who can assist us whether we have any questions from our online audience well yeah yeah please does again i think i think we'll take does again we'll take your question and we'll handle those two and we probably do then need to get on to the next session uh, thank you chair um Uh, thank you for those well, three incredible presentations, actually. Uh, just a few observations uh, that you may want to react to. Uh, one is the, the similarity of the narrative that Brazil and South Africa tends to maintain. I think based primarily on, on our own hosting of the summits, actually, Rio, Johannesburg, Rio, uh, and bringing together the first the environmental agenda, now the climate agenda, much closer to the development agenda, isn't generally shared by other nations in the way they use the same opportunities to chair other systems, whether it's, it's the G20 or, or IPSA or, or the UNFCCC. And maybe you want to comment on how we can use this process to be more knitting around that. <clears throat> the second is that we all are generally very dismayed at how even when we manage those few ambitious statements in the outcomes of the COPs, maintaining the momentum around implementation has been extraordinarily difficult. And there are so many examples of this. I mean, the, the latest disappointment may be the Bridgetown Initiative. And one of the discussions that is happening individually in the Global South, but not together, is how the South can actually lead some of these initiatives. And, and Brazil is one of the very big players in this space. And I was really interested in the way you were describing that triple helix, and whether or not you are teasing out some formulae around how we can make this stick. I'll pause there. Thank you. Hello. Um, first, I didn't acknowledge, but it was really nice. I missed uh, Juliana's presentation with somebody that I'm sure contributed a lot to the debate. Um, in relation to the question of continuity and relationship there, I mean, obviously, in theory and in my mind, we do have a great chance to make these links between G20, COP29, and COP30. Uh, I think even from COP28, I think there is that uh, you know, linkage there. Uh, if you think that, as I said, the key outcome of the globe stock take, Pedro, was uh, that not only we have problems in terms of the targets to achieve 1.5, we are in 2.1 to 2.4, but a b even a bigger gap on implementation. That, that's what it says there. Now, the Globe Stock Taking said uh, implementation is lagging to 2.7, perhaps, yeah, and targets is 2.1. So we needed to, um, to strengthen both ambitions and implementation, and I think that's exactly what the message that Brazil is bringing to the G20. It's no good just to think about targets, although we need to think about targets, Uh, but we do need to think about the implementation as a leverage to even more ambition. Because if countries have some, some certainties that their plans are going to be implemented, then obviously they may have even more appetite to have plans. And at the moment, many countries have had plans in their first NGCs, and they have been unable to implement their own plans. So you do need to talk about means of implementation together with ambition. It's not to postpone ambition, it's not that, it's not that as an excuse, but 
just the opposite is to leverage more ambitious and i think that is the intention for as i said i think we have a very big challenge and therefore we do need the success of cop 29 which is talking about finance not only the 100 billion but the broader financial issues in which some of the initiatives like the Bridgetown and others may have a good chance to be agreed there, which I really hope so, because we need to unlock that finance that's now blocked uh, in the North. And I think everybody understand that. And I think the question now is how to go forward with that. For COP30, uh, as everybody knows, the big deliverable of COP30 is ambitious NDCs to get to 1.5, the supposed uh, mission 1.5. But again, Brazil is saying uh, ambition NDCs means uh, not only targets, but means of implementation. So as in Brazil, we're doing our climate plan at the moment, in which we have uh, eight sectorial mitigation plans and 15 uh, adaptation plans. And each of those plans will be plans. They are not going to be just targets. They will be plans. They will, will know how much does it cost to implement each of them, which economic instruments we have and others that we may need to, to create, or regulatory changes that we need to implement them. By the time we have them uh, ready, uh, each of them can be also be investment plans rather than just a climate plan. So if most of our countries are able to do that, and I know that's why we're developing the climate plan together with our finance minister <laughs> uh, with the ecologic transformation, because now we see that linkage there. I think we can then have ambitious NDCs that will be implemented rather than just there. So I see th that link. And obviously, Troika helped us a great deal because we now have Troika, Brazil, uh, Azerbaijan, and the, um, uh, the Emirates, all, all those three countries, emerging countries. So that vision that you just mentioned about bringing development, economic growth, well-being, is under Troika as well, very aligned, different countries, but very aligned. And therefore, we think we can uh, now build in that link. And specifically, I, I know in your question, if all the countries are already thinking about development, I think, uh, let us remember NDCs, we all done our NDCs once. We just have one NDC so far, and now 2025, we only have the second NDCs from all countries. And I think many countries uh, design NDCs and climate policies as something on the side. It was like a niche. And it's becoming uh, for every country that if you don't m mainstream in development, you're not going to go far. And I think, th and we don't have all the economic instruments to mainstream that yet. So I think we're just on that transition. I think many countries in the developing world understand that, but perhaps don't have all the capacities that they need to do that. I think international finance is still thinking about climate finance and development finance as if those two things are not linked to each other. Obviously, they have these specialities, but they also link to each other. So I think we are in that transition. But I think most of the mechanisms are not there yet. And as I said, I think what we needed to, to ensure is that uh, that mindset uh, that brings development and climate, it cannot be just good for climate. Being good for climate is obviously good for development, and being good for development is good for climate. Uh, that language we see that some people use as if those two things uh, no, if I put money into the development, uh, no, uh, we hear that all the time. Uh, the international banks are taking money from development and then put into climate and are taking money. Uh, the developed countries are trying to you know, disguise climate into development. And yes, there is some truth in that, but I don't think that that's a good fight. I think we need to mainstream climate and development. When you're doing schools, there has to be a resilient school. When we're doing a bridge, it has to be a resilient b bridge. It's not any bridge, because we know otherwise we'll have 
you know, cost two times uh, to deal with. So I think we are in the way, but I don't think we are yet there with uh, all countries. That's a bit my perception. Absolutely so true. I mean, development has to be, we have to have climate resilient development, right? There's no question. And we understand the sensitivities about kind of trying to define those when it comes to, uh, to finance. But in practical terms, really, when we're looking at what's going on at ground level, it makes absolutely no sense to be thinking about those two separately. Very good. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. I hope you're able to stick around. Have a good, uh, have good, good meeting there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Got to take the opportunity for a quick, quick photo opportunity. All right, fantastic. Um, well, we've now reached the stage in our program where we're going to dive into uh, the work of the working group, so uh, I will now be stepping stepping down from the stage. I'm going to hand over to um, the co-chair of our uh, working group on loss and damage, Professor Jorge Shadik, known to many of you from the Pontifical Catholic University of Argentina, and he will take this session forward. The session will continue until 12.40. We're starting about 10 minutes late, so let's say about 12.40, and that'll lead us into lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordan. Uh, first, I want to thank the South African Institute of International Affairs for putting together this initiative of these two working groups that are presenting their preliminary findings today. And I joined very enthusiastically the invitation uh, for this task force because throughout my work in development over 30 years and in my last post as director of the UN Office for South-South Cooperation, one element I detected in the development debate is that we still follow the parameters that come to us from the North in all areas of development, and climate is no exception. In addition to that, there is more capacity in the North. It was mentioned here in two different presentations. Uh, there is more academic tradition, there are more resources. So therefore, they have more, uh, in addition to more ability to uh, articulate their political power in the, di in the different international fora. So therefore, they dominate the debate, in spite of the fact that we in the Global South have the numbers and have the issues, we generally fight in their own dialectical and conceptual territory. Uh, so one of my jobs when I was director of the office was to promote the development of Southern thinking. I sponsored many joint activities of think tanks of the South, and I'm very proud and very glad to see that we have a re achieved critical mass. I think the people that are sitting around this table, around these chairs, I exclude myself, can argue face to face with anything tanker from the north. One challenge is to translate this thinking that we have into the political process. And that's the beauty of doing this in the context of the Brazilian and South Africa consecutive G20 presidencies. The G20 is a very powerful space, and although not specifically devoted to climate, if we manage to succeed in including these elements in the, in the debate will help facilitate the, the COP process uh, at upcoming, especially the PARA uh, COP30 that will take place next year here in Belen in Brazil. Uh, one point I want to make before introducing the author of the draft collaboration that we're going to make on uh, loss and damage is that while studying the issue, not just for this exercise, but also 
as a professor I am at the Catholic University and in the Foreign Service Institute in Argentina, is how complex these negotiations are and how difficult it is for us to articulate those negotiations into public knowledge and public messaging. It was very easy, at the, particularly for the countries of the North, to make the case and also imply that it would have marginal costs for them to make a global contribution to change. Uh, but when push comes to shove, they tend to go back. Or look at what the farmers are doing in Europe. They've succeeded in, in basically uh, cancelling the Mercosur European Union pact, uh, pact because of the implications of climate change negotiations and opening up their markets to the south. But in the south, we don't have that articulation. We don't, we, it is very difficult for us to make the linkage. And I, one worry I have is that these just transitions we're talking about don't become an element for the countries of the North in the debate to justify keeping development at a lower stage in the Global South. We cannot accept that a, a farmer in Africa be given a guilt trip because he gets electricity. And the debate is going in that direction. So in addition to the excellent contributions that are being made here, the great work that was presented here of the T20, the great job of IPEA, I'm very proud to be here in IPEA. Uh, we were very close partners while I had the honor of serving with the UN in Brazil. I was director of a joint partnership that was called the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth. As I was saying, the challenge is to get the global knowledge we're producing to the policy, political decision makers from the South, push them to get them in the political spaces, the global political spaces, utilizing the new instruments that are being created, be them BRICS Plus, uh, IPSA, India, Brazil, South Africa, uh, the G77, which in New York, unfortunately, is not working satisfactorily, and also develop a language for the South and for the North on how this transition has to be undertaken in a way that doesn't hinder the possibility of social progress and social development in the Global South. Now, after this uh, introduction, I would like to invite uh, Professor Maria del Pilar Bueno. She's also from Argentina, from the city of Rosario. She's the leader of an entity called Argentina 1.5. Uh, let's hope we get to Argentina 2.0 sooner rather than later. And she prepared the draft lead paper that is being worked on by the working group. We're going to have a virtual meeting next week. I want to salute my co-chair, Dr. Abla al nashif from Egypt, who has not been able to come here today. And I will ask her to present the paper and then open it f for comments from you, from the participants of the network, and try to reach some conclusions on how to move this forward and enrich this process. So without uh, further ado, I would like to invite Maria del Pilar to take the uh, we cannot say take the floor, to take the screen. So the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Jorge. Uh, please let me know if you can hear me well, so I, I can be sure everything is okay. Could anybody give me a signal? Okay, I know in the chat it's okay, in the auditorium it's also okay. Great. Thank you. Is there? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know if if Abla would like to uh, speak first or make any comment, or do I just leave it to the audience? Please, not to see if you are if you see it. It's not it's not that clear. But to see if Abla is still working. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you, Jorge. Um, for your leader. 
Keep the lovely blue card by Chloe. Um, the uh, Ed and Israel uh, Daisy Kiss and Satan by Lily and David Wolf uh, from Chloe. Um, I think that's it. I'm not sure that I have anything else to add. Thank you very much. As, as I said, it's just a short one. I will try to focus more time with the um, with the next step and where we are. Um, so the the um, the next paper, which is for the Paris Environmental, is related to the eradication of the global pest human two, and in terms of loss and damage due to pollution, in particular in the United Kingdom. But of course, trying to to build the bridges that we need to build with other fora, including this one from from Chloe. So um, let's go to the next one, please. Um, here, the idea more or less is very quickly to try um, to identify some of the main issues here to start a conflict that, of course, is not comprehensive enough in, in the uh, paper, but it tries to at least recognize uh, current situation in terms of international in, uh, conflicts, including um, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, as well as the conflict in the Middle East. Um, we also need to um, acknowledge the impact of these global issues in international relations in general and at the regional level also, including the impact on energy prices, food prices, and how these also link to transition and in particular that transition. That is something that um, at least all people I, I heard in the previous presentation, including Jorge and, and our friend, uh, all of them referred to this, the importance of having these clarified visions with respect to the transition and for us that is also to consider that transition from objectives to a vision. So we also need to recognize that COP28 in Dubai was a key milestone in the relationship with CO2 clusters, in particular with respect to loss and damage, but not only. Uh, firstly, the COP29 mission uh, the first global sector for CO2 to close the climate uh, the climate change of this process that uh, as you may uh, know uh, it refers to the collective assessment of the global goal uh, of the Paris agreement that is in mitigation but also in taxation in finance energy capacity building and all these topics uh, even though at the very beginning loss and damage was not um, a clear transition category for CO2. Now it is, and that's also um, a key issue I would like to come back later in a moment. At the same time, we also need to recognize that during this mission we had the opportunity to have um, the stability of the global goal and taxation framework, um, and that is um, that that is critical. So it was a negotiation of, of a decade, but finally of two years uh, from the Glasgow Climate Project Program to uh, this um, UN framework, including four targets, one uh, the different moments of the adaptation across the cycle, and seven targets on sectors for different topics that will be um, implemented and also is now through the next year uh, a new work program in order to develop the indicator. In particular, with respect to the loss and damage, um, on loss and damage, we have, um, it is also key, and we will have a, 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 an opportunity to, to talk about that in, in a moment. I will go directly to that for now. So let's go to the next one, please. Yeah, this one. No, the next one, please. Um, to, to say very quickly that we need to recognize that uh, we have different contexts for loss and damage compensation. Uh, in the US CCC context, the, poli the policy debate um, is um, more than a decade. And of course, we have a key milestone with the win of a World Conference on the Mechanism for Loss and Damage, um, addressing loss and damage related to climate change. So many times we talk about loss and damage with capital letters and uh, related to the US CCC context and the uh, damages and impacts for uh, when we talk about this in, in IPCC, for example. So 
the use of new things so we can get access to that research and many other international research and, and the research project. Then, then in front of just to say very quickly, um, because we, I will not focus on these, but just to, to, to recognize recently uh, that uh, the loss and damage to date in the UNFCCC uh, is focused both in economic and non-economic uh, dimensions and at the same time on uh, slow uh, onset events and um, all kinds of um, extreme events uh, as the UGA research mentioned. So this is also part, part of, the, of the key discussion in the UNFCCC because um, we some, sometimes uh, some mechanisms and, and some practice were more focused on some kinds of events or more focused on some types of losses. So it's very critical that Karen architecture that we are going to talk about is focused in both type of events as well as in both type of losses. That's the main purpose of this image that is from the UNFCCC. Let's go to the next one, please. Um, so with respect to where we are in uh, these more than a decade uh, of work in loss and damage, we need to recognize that we have, of course, um, um, the, all the WIM architecture, the Warsaw International Mechanism, uh, even though a governance issue related to WIM is not solved. I will not focus on that because that is more um, let's say it's uh, it's overarching discussion in the UNFCCC with respect to the governance right now most of the bodies of the UNFCCC are blocked because of this discussion not blocked in terms of work but for example the approval of of some reports the approval of some uh, work plans etc because um, this governance issue with respect to the role of the UNFCCC or the convention itself and the role of the Paris Agreement and the discussion this is a north south discussion is in many times in many in many cases blocking uh, the decisions with respect to the reports so that is also uh, applicable to the win but we are not so focused on that in this discussion because probably but this is a, a first view of course is for for discussing in this fora too we don't see an opportunity for unblocking this um um, with NGOs and or, or academia trying to push for that for this year in particular. But of course, if that is the case, in your view, we, we can also give that discussion. We really focus more uh, on um, current processes, where we are, which are the opportunities and the challenges. And on that regard, uh, let me say that in terms of the GST, something um, quick to recognize is that for the first time, and, and also different to the Article 14 of the agreement and also some decisions previously we achieved together, the loss and damage and adaptation are separate parts from the GST decision and that was a lot because that's a very long uh, fight uh, from developing countries to recognize the differences between adaptation and loss and damage and even though we have Article 7 and Article 8 of the Paris Agreement in many cases after Paris Agreement even we don't have this opportunity to see and this is we will we will see other examples such as BTRs uh, but many many other issues that we can refer to so this is the first issue that I think we we need to to recognize as well as um, the progress of institutional uh, arrangements, including Santiago Network, uh, the fund and the funding arrangements. With respect to the Santiago Network, you probably remember that it was established in Madrid uh, in COP25. Um, and um, last year we have um, a problem with the discussion among developing countries with respect to the host um, in particular, Latin American countries and African countries discussions. Uh, we are happy that this discussion really could uh, achieve a good outcome. And now we have the opportunity during COP29 to have the consortium of UNDRR and UNOPS as uh, the host of the Secretariat. And recently also the solution with respect to the location uh, that will be in Geneva. So the first meeting of the advisory board could take place very recently, some, some weeks ago, or even it was not a month, but three weeks. 
uh, and now we have um, uh, an interesting progress uh, with the, the, the real operationalization of the network. Um, then with respect to fund and funding arrangements, we also can say that um, the adoption in Dubai of the recommendations of the Transitional Committee uh, were critical and also a good move from, from the presidency in terms of doing this at the very beginning to avoid the trade-off of the last day. So you lose everything just for one thing. That is um, quite a strategy, a very good move that needs to be recognized. And in that way, um, of course, there was a big trade-off in the role of the World Bank as trustee and secretariat host, something that developing countries uh, with the G77 and China uh, leading that process didn't want. Uh, but at the same time, it was very clear during the five meetings of the Transitional Committee that was the only way. So to have a very strong and independent board is quite important right now to, to maintain that, um, that balance. Uh, also, uh, a good news, not good enough, but good news was uh, the different, uh, of course, uh, pledges that uh, some countries made to the fund, uh, less than 800 million in Dubai. And um, also you will see in this, uh, before I move to the, to the recommendations and what we see as challenges and, and work ahead, let me say that they are have the issue of liability and compensation with the Red Cross, just to say that uh, we need to remember that this is um, a critical issue for developing developed countries all the time. This is included in Decision 1 CP21 accompanying the Paris Agreement in 2015 because it is a red line for them, as, as they said many times. So for many reasons, there are interpretation of current developments, both in terms of supporting developing countries with technical assistance with the Santiago network and with finance in terms of fund and funding arrangements uh, from their view that cannot be interpreted as liability and compensation rec uh, recognition. So this is something that um, today or the day after at some point will need to be solved. Um, so this is also part of all the situation and all the context of this particular topic, as, as Jorge said before, a, a difficult one, um, but of course challenging, but interesting and very, very important as uh, recognizing the third pillar of the, of the uh, Paris Agreement in terms of action. Let's go to the next one. Uh, for that reason, to, to say that um, our view here is to trying to put that in a very clear way. So understand that um, the uh, loss and damage right now is the third pillar in the Paris Agreement. And from uh, COP28 to COP30 in Brazil, we will have a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. So this year, COP29 is the finance COP. We all know that. We are uh, mostly prepared for that. But for sure, there are many issues and that are, of course, related to also to the fund and funding arrangements of loss and damage, including the, the number. Of course, the amount is very, very important, an amount that is related to the needs of developing countries introduced in their um, documents, because if not, is I mean, that's the main purpose of the developing countries really submitting in their NAPs, in their NDCs, in their BTRs right now, in their adaptation communications, and many other documents uh, to the UNFCCC, their priorities, their, their needs, the costs of those priorities and needs. So this is critical. The amount is very important. At the same time, the opportunity to have sub goals for adaptation and loss and damage, and of course for mitigation as um, a symbol for recognition of the third pillars, but in particular, not only as a symbol, but because we really need to have finance very clear, separated. And that is also related to transparency, because right now we don't have adaptation and loss and damage transparency well separated and recognized. So we have a clear risk of having double counting because a developed country that made a pledge for loss and damage right now will really submit or report that as adaptation because they don't have right now in current reporting system for finance 
um, any other system in order to report that. So the double counting is, is assured right now. So we really need to take care of that and to solve it. At the same time, the discussion on finance, in particular on loss and damage, but also in adaptation, is quite related to the access and expediting access for developing countries, but also for communities, for cities, because uh, we know how difficult it is even for a country, but even more for a city or community to really access to, to, to funds. So this is also very important in all the context of finance, and as well as the quality of the finance, because uh, right now, as you may see in the different reports, even of the standing committee of BNFTPOC, as well as OECD, Oxfam, and many others, we uh, now the balance is going quite more to loans and not grants. So this is not acceptable at all because it's not a principle of the convention, but at the same time, it really implies a burden in terms of debt of developing countries. So um, I think that this, is, this should be also recognized and considered very carefully. Eligibility criteria and donor base, you probably know that developed countries are now very strong trying to say that without a conversation on the donor base, they are not disposed to start the conversations really on the amount and the needs and everything, not only in loss and damage, but in everything, the whole package. And that is really not acceptable at all. The discussion on the donor base eligibility criteria, criteria was also taken last year in the context of the fund and funding arrangements for loss and damage and was agreed with a clear um, commitment of developing countries of being together and coming together for this discussion. And I think that is critical for this year and the year uh, that we have ahead to Brazil. So short, long, medium and long term uh, strategies to really um, have predict predictable and adequate resources for loss and damage and of course for adaptation to, um, to guarantee the, the security of distribution uh, among the communities, the different regions, the, uh, the autonomy of the board, because that's a trade-off with the World Bank that is quite critical. So um, for the full operationalization of the fund and funding arrangements, we need to be very careful in terms of the role of the board. And now we are even trying to still struggling with the developed countries uh, submitting their names for the board. Also, Santiago Network need to be in the next two years fully operationalized to finalize and adopt all the guidelines, the procedures that started in this first um, a board meeting in March. We will have two more meetings during the year. So it's important that for COP29, these um, documents are prepared and more or less agreed. Uh, so uh, the conversations are, are better. And again, to avoid more trade off with all the NCQG discussion that will be and is already very heavy. Uh, my last points. Uh, are related to the BTRs and the role with M MDCs also. And as I said, uh, we know that uh, Brazilian COP is, is, relate, is related to ambition, all the, the sides of ambition, not only mitigation, adaptation, but also means of implementation and loss and damage. So BTRs round that of this year, 2024, really need to inform the next round of MDCs because this is the first cycle of ambition, and we are starting the second uh, uh, cycle of ambition. So the relationship between the two processes is very important, and the role that NGOs, academia, and many other uh, stakeholders is important here. We cannot let go the BTR and what was said there, or, or what uh, the country said, without really understanding their relationship with the cycle, the last cycle and also the next cycle. So that's that's also a critical issue and the role of Brazil um, for the next COP but with this and the next round, but also uh, with respect to G20, that is a step in the middle and part of, of Troika uh, in both places. I also want, would like to finish uh, by saying that 
again, NGOs, academia, many stakeholders, we have a, a role to play in terms of understanding better uh, loss and damage negotiations, to involve more in these negotiations that are difficult, um, but, but really we need to understand the nuances and try to provide um, support to developing countries in particular for their uh, former positions, for the different groups, try to support G77 and China position, a unified uh, voice uh, if it's possible, because that really make last negotiations on finance quite better. We need to recognize that, including the last case of the fund and the funding arrangements. So I leave it for now, and I'm very happy to, to continue the discussion with, with all of you. Thanks. the paper before this event and it is a very thorough uh, review of the process as you could see here and the thoroughness is also uh, a demonstration of the extreme complexity of the process so we are talking complexity within complexity because the the negotiations the climate negotiations in themselves are extremely convoluted and we added a new element which is critical for the south and I think it's very important for this group because this is really a southern issue. Los and damage is an area where we are in a position to make our mark. It is in the agenda because the G77 plus China got its act together and used the weight of its numbers to incorporate the agenda, the issue on the agenda. And now we have to make the decisions about the Secretariat. We lost the initial battle with the, with the World Bank. Now UNOPS and UNDRR want to be the Secretariat. Is that the best agreement? Is there an alternative? The, there is this alternative of the uh, Caribbean Development Bank. Again, uh, it's a space where we have to show, or we can show, considering the scope of the discussion that the South can get this act together. And I make a call for Brazil particularly because I'm sure this will not be settled. In COP29 it will spill over into COP30 and there the leadership of Brazil would be critical. Incidentally, I want to say something why I'm so hopeful about Belen. I was here when uh, Bra uh, Rio Plus 20 took place. And Rio Plus 20 was until the conference started a disaster. Basically, as you know, in a conference process you have agreed paragraphs and bracketed paragraphs, the ones that need agreement. When the negotiating process ended, the only non-bracketed paragraphs are the ones saying, thank you Brazil for hosting the conference and we'll meet again. So the rest was totally bracketed. But I have to say, during the time Brazil had been working, it's, a, it's, it's not a matter for today, so I make the detail brief. So they managed to get a document that they had been preparing in secret, taking into account the red lines of everybody, and they put it together, and we have now, the 2030 agenda was basically born there. The SDGs are a creation of their keeping national, uh, common but differentiated responsibilities was there. The alternative measurement of development was there. And many other elements that now we feel are, we take for granted or we feel that came from the 2015 agenda were born there, led by the Brazilian presidency. So I'm very confident that between the Brazilian team and the Itamaraty team that is being led by the same people that led the Rio Plus 20 process will be able to to advance very positively and I think we should feed them with the proper knowledge for them to handle this. Uh, in this session I would like now my co-chair if she's uh, to, to take the, the floor and perhaps lead us until the end of the session if your time in Cairo allows you uh, Dr. Abla, so the floor is yours, my friend. 
Thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, let me start by saying that I will not be able to, to take you through the full session because I'm fasting. It's Ramadan in Egypt. And, and soon enough, it's going to be time for breaking fast. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just do my part, listen to part of the, of the discussion, and then hand it back to you. And we're very aligned on all of this, Jorge. So uh, uh, you, are doing, you are doing a great job. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Saya for the exercise, for the idea of the topic and having the working group, and the idea of focusing on a specific issue like loss and damage and dig deep into it. Because unfortunately, all the talk about climate seems to be on the generality, on the broad line. And this does not take us in. So digging deep, I think, is a great uh, uh, move by Saya. So I like thank him for this. And I wish I would have been able to go to Brazil to, uh, uh, to join in this, but unfortunately it was not possible. Uh, uh, Pilar, I, I think you did a very good job, really thorough job, in putting all the facts together. Literally, like somebody was starting to play cards and have all the cards on the table, okay? And the minute you have all the cards on the table, and the minute you have something that's written, thoroughly questions, more questions actually uh, um, emerge. So uh, let me make my comments in the form of actually few questions that 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 emerged when I read your paper. This whole thing about is about climate justice. Okay? This whole thing, all right? And the big question is whether climate justice is being realized with what we are observing so far. Okay? And my answer is, despite everything that's happening, it's not being realized. Okay? And and the rest of the questions are going to raise this issue further. Okay. I lived through COP27 when it took place in Shah Sheikh in Egypt, okay. and I remember very well how they were pushing and even added an extra day and worked you know, at dawn when they could hardly open their eyes in order to reach something in relation to specifically the loss and damage. And again, they ended up creating a box, a very nice box, but it was a healthy box. It had absolutely nothing. And it had to wait until the COP28. Then COP28 did its move, and we are saying now, okay, we're waiting for COP29, and then we're going to wait for COP30, and we're going to go for COP31, perhaps. The big issue is, can the world continue to keep working on this treadmill? Because we seem to be working on a treadmill. We are doing a lot of things, but we are out to reach. Can the world afford not to have compensation for the needs of the developing countries, okay, in specific, okay, where the most due to climate issues. Can we afford to keep on waiting? Uh, as Pilar was saying, it was, this is the 27th one, the outcome of 10 years of work. So 10 years of work, uh, 27, it's like a lifetime people are growing old and, and we don't see much up. So it is really a concern. Uh, and, and, uh, and then moving from one cup to the other cup. Okay, it's like from one year to the other year. In between, things could happen. In between, decisions can be taken and uh, things could move, but they don't move. Okay, so this is actually, for me, the big issue. Second point, uh, uh, Pilar, when you were talking about, and it was actually written for people, not if you said it in the presentation, but you were talking about the financing so it was a bounty ride. And it was a bounty ride from the beginning and continuing. And the amount of money that ended up being assigned is ridiculously small in comparison to the needs. Okay? And then when you look at the context, when you look at uh, the war in Ukraine, when you look at what's happening in, in, in Gaza, the other in Gaza, okay, do you think the Western countries are going to be to are going to honor their commitments which are already way less than what is needed on the climate level in general? So would, would they be able to do that? I think it's, it's a very big question and I think we need to be prepared with scenarios. If they don't do that, what is the global South expected and should do? Okay? Uh, my third uh, uh, question is in a way Related to the, I think we should challenge a little bit the institutional structure of the fund itself. Okay, when I read the paper and he said they are going to have in the board 12 members from the developed countries and 14 members from the developing countries, and frankly, I was I was surprised. There are too many in developed countries, so the, the decision making is going to be an unanimous one. Come on, all right. Now let's think a little bit here. I mean, they are going to address topics like reconstruction and rebuilding. When you talk at, like, about a place like Gaza and what's happening in Gaza and all this incredible destruction that's taking place and there's need for reconstruction, do you think the Western countries that are on the board are going to be willing 
who are to take money to the construction of Gaza, you think? Uh, because, because it's, actually, uh, it's, it's, it's actually slowing down the, 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 the climate, which is actually causing more harm to the climate. So the institutional structure needs to be challenged, okay? Because they might not be go anywhere. Okay? That's that's my 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 second uh, my or my third point. Uh, uh, my fourth point is related to. Loss and damage and, uh, and adaptation. Loss and damage is really something that's really very, very, very small, okay? And it's meant to be to contribute to the uh, realization of, of, of justice, okay? And there is always a fear in the global south that focus, the minute they put money on the loss and damage, they are going to take it from somewhere else. I mean, it's not going to... They, we need money on loss and damage. We need money on adaptation, which is not even measured, okay? It's badly needed. It's important. Okay, it's not. It's not. What is going to happen, really? Okay, is 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 interest in loss and damage and all those institutional and governance and framework and all. Is it can it blur attention away from adaptation, which is something that's extremely uh, uh, um, important and for which there is no measure. Okay, that, in my opinion, comes the most important point. Okay, do we have the preconditions for success in? The loss and damage negotiations. Okay, I think a lot, uh, uh, like like Jorge mentioned as well, a lot falls on the on the shoulders of Brazil, okay, and on on Lula's shoulders actually in specific, okay, because a precondition for success is for the global South to have a voice. I mean, in in the in the recommendations you made the pillar and you said that think tanks have to talk about what needs to be done. We have to insist on grants instead of Loans, we have to, we have to, we have to. Okay? Have to comes from the global south. If you have 14 members on the board and 12 powerful members from the Western world, okay, the bigger global south, which has 80% of the population of the world at this point, okay, needs to be there. And to be there okay, needs to be pushed for by G20, since it seems to be the thing where we can push things. G7 cannot help with anything. G20 has a better chance. And the fact that it's in Brazil, and Brazil and its president, okay, have the, uh, their heart in the right place, okay, and they know exactly what needs uh, to be done, and that the global south is facing an unfair situation, okay. And I don't have to remind you that a continent like Africa contributes no more than three percent to the GDP of the world, okay, and roughly three percent to the damage that's taking place, and yet it is bearing all the negative impacts of the climate. Uh, 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 degradation, okay? Whether we're talking about uh, 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 desertification, we're talking about floods, we're talking about problems in agriculture, poverty, sickness, we're carrying all this, okay? And yet, okay, they, they, nobody is actually uh, accounting for any of the historical rights of that of that continent, which has always been abused by the developed world, okay? This calls for a louder voice of the global south. And the louder voice of the global south, unfortunately, is not going to take place within the existing system. Because, I mean, for the fund itself is being hosted by the World Bank. Who are the players in the World Bank? Who are the players in the, in the IMF? Okay. We are talking about the same big Western countries that are actually responsible for the climate, for the climate damage. There is a call for a new economic order. There is a call for a new complete system, not only uh, uh, um, a change in the financial architecture, which is a very ni nice uh, term, all right, which is actually scratching the surface, okay, it's, it's cute, all right, financial architecture, it's, a, it's, a, it's, very, it's very poetic, all right, we, what is needed is a much bigger change, okay, we need a new Bretton Woods Agreement, Bretton Woods Agreement was done after the Second World War, at the time, the balance of power was completely different than what is there now, okay? We are now in a completely different situation, and the Global South needs to be heard. And I think this is a very, very, very big responsibility on Brazil in, 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 in hosting G20, and following it by uh, 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 COP30 uh, uh, for, for the climate issues. Uh, these were the points that I had in mind. What, as, as, as Jose man, mentioned, we're going to have meetings with the work groups next week. I think with the working, uh, with the working groups, uh, uh, Pilar, we need to focus on the how question. The objectives 
are very well presented on your part with all the product. How? How are we going to do that? Okay? And what are the different scenarios? So we need to challenge the situation, whether it's institutional or, 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 or fund or whatever, all the steps, okay? And, and then say, okay, what are the different scenarios? If the Western world chooses not to commit enough funds, what should we do as a global South? What should we focus on? We say we have to set the priorities and subcategories, okay? What subcategories? What are the priorities? I think the discussion with the group, the brainstorming on the basis of the very well-written policy brief that you have with all the facts, I think it's going to make, uh, uh, make us reach uh, a, a lot of good results, a lot of scenarios on how things uh, um, can take place and can, and can happen. And I think this is, ful will fulfill the objective of, of, of SIA in digging deep into loss and damage by itself to, to see what can be done. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Jorge, where are you? Thank you. Thank you, okay. Bye. Questions or contributions from both the flow and those who are connected online uh, to this topic, both to the substance of it or some of the comments on process that were made principally by me and by Dr. Al Nashif. So the floor is open. Yes, please. All the speakers give their name and institutions before making their points. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's uh, Desikan Naidu from the uh, Presidential Climate Commission in South Africa. Uh, I, I, I found uh, a colleague from Egypt's presentation both on point and very sober. And I just want to add two more things to what she's already said. Uh, the first is that we're, we're seeing this year major elections around the world, there are 49. And the shift to the right is clearly going to be one of the dominant characteristics. Uh, there are some indicators already with the ones that have happened. The big one coming up is the European parliamentary election and then a series of other individual ones. And these have really, really big implications for what is achievable in this new term around these negotiations, which is demanding a global solidarity. Yeah? And I think we have to factor that into the equation. The second, and, and this might not be a popular comment, but I, I think the South has, has lost its way a little bit around these negotiations. I mean, we far too easily have been drawn into the machinations of the governance discussions and the modalities discussions to the point where common and differentiated responsibility needs to be reminded to global south players, let alone the global north players. Uh, and, and, and it means something, and it means something really important. We, the, the, the West has been damn successful around putting historical emissions to the bottom of the list. I mean, their PR campaigns around India and China in particular, but other players in the global south in the last 10 years or so, has yielded fruit that if we're now talking about big emitters at the calculation point in the immediate term and ignoring the fact that the accumulated effect is something that isn't there. So I, I think that what we should be thinking about uh, in a more structured way is what is achievable in the formal arena and what Brazil is trying to do around using this microcosm, a very important, very gigantic microcosm of the global community uh, practice in the G20 
as a stepping up to the to COP30. It's brilliant. But we also need to be strategizing around what happens outside those theaters of operation, around re-injecting some of the things that I think we were riding a good wave on, especially in the 1990s, a little bit before that as well, and finding newer ways to reinforce that debate around it. Because the whole issue around liability and attribution, uh, there, there are already plethora of papers that are coming out in scientific journals questioning the association of climate change and extreme weather events. And you can see exactly where this is going. And there are major funds becoming available to fund those kinds of research. It's like the cigarette research uh, of yesteryear is, is coming back all over again. So, you know, an appreciation of the, uh, both the complexity and the intensity of the problem and, and a multi-level strategy, I think, is exactly what's needed now. Thanks, Chip. That's my contribution. I meant to that. I mean, I find that your contribution is very valuable. I think one of the objectives that we can try to get in the next 26 hours we'll be meeting is the how. No? I think we're all in agreement that the negotiations are being run in, in the visiting pitch and they are dictating the terms. And I feel this is a place where we have to work on how to level that playing field and not even level, just to to have the interests of the Global South more prominent in this place. And you want to take the floor? Yeah, uh, Alex Bankenstein. My thoughts just go to, to the scale. Uh, that slide we saw around uh, quick onset and so on, certain impacts. And uh, we think about the, the costs of of, the, of, of losses and damage of, of some natural disasters we've had just in the past few years. It's, it's, it's this kind of quandary of having to insist on ambitious funding, obviously much more funding that's been created thus far, while recognizing that in one sense, if we just purely look at, at the loss and damage of, of, of just natural disasters, that almost no amount of funding that is in any way politically feasible would be sufficient, and how to kind of balance those two realities. But also to, uh, and I myself am not, am not too updated on, on how advanced this debate is, but start with some discussions around how this how this funding might be applied, some some principles. Um, I mean, my thoughts go uh, in our region to the Africa Risk Capacity, which is a uh, uh, an agency linked to the African Union Commission um, that is designed to operate regionally and in as an efficient way as possible, uh, support primarily farmers um, to to recover from from uh, from climate damage or damage to to their crops and there's huge innovations there that uh, I think the point is is, is there that uh, we need to think about solutions um, that are regionally oriented and as we think about the funding we should also be thinking about how these interventions are designed in a way to ensure that we essentially get the most bang for our buck. Um, how we use technology, big data, all sorts of uh, solutions um, to to increase increase the impact. So I guess the, uh, that's a bit rambling, but I guess the question is, um, how do we see the process going through around agreeing to to principles around how those, how that funding will be applied, because there is, of course, a risk in the context of limited funding and in the context of need that vastly surpasses uh, the funding that's available. That uh, it 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 could it could turn into uh, uh, a race, a fight amongst countries of the global south to access this funding, and that itself might undermine the cohesion that's required to drive the uh, 
a loss of damage agenda forward. Hey, thank you very much. Any other comments? Online we have comments. Please identify yourself and make the comments. which specifically focuses on climate financing and just transition. Um, thank you so much for, for everyone's contributions this morning. And I, I kind of recognize from, a, from a, a, a Brazil point of view that there's a lot of work structurally that's gone in to, um, for instance, the task force, which I would like to comment on, but I think we've moved since then and maybe I'll get another opportunity. But just on the, on the loss and damage the loss and damage discussion, I very much do feel, in this and everything else to do with the, the transition, that the Global South is being led and not leading. I mean, it, it's, it's very clear. Um, and, and I'm particularly concerned, even for loss and damage, that there are certain precedents that are being created and going to be created, which we're going to find are going to be very difficult to extricate um, the global south from. So I think it's really important that countries that are chasing the money, and there is a chase for the money, Alex, as you mentioned, um, that these precedents that are being created are, are not going to be for the, for the global good. So I think we should really take things quite seriously. And I'm quite sad just kind of listening to, to this, the whole morning there. But what I also want to, want you to um, highlight is that in this, in this um, process of being led and, and the Global South not leading, there is one um, refrain that keeps on coming out of this, um, and that is the request for de-risking. And de-risking by the countries um, themselves, because this is what happens ultimately, right? Any investment that needs to go into, uh, um, in, into the space uh, um, has to have a revenue stream and that revenue stream needs to be guaranteed. And I think from a finance point of view, we are very, very far removed from a de-risking conversation which um, needs to be brought to the fore. And I didn't see it in any of the slides over this, so far this morning. If one looks at the loss and damage fund, for instance, I mean, what I see involving and the discussion, if it's a World Bank discussion, is if we go down a, a, a kind of a catastrophe bond mindset, uh, um, you know, and this becomes an insurance vehicle, um, and the insurance vehicle gets put back to the private sector. So the other po the second point I really wanted to make was, when we talk about um, finance and private sector finance, what do we really mean? And I don't think we've got to grips about what what that means and how the global financial system, not just from a multilateral point of view, but really fundamentally on the private sector finance, we've seen a shift from the bond markets to private equity. And everybody talks about private equity and bringing private equity into the equation. But we have got no understanding of what that really means. And I think it's really time we start getting into some of that detail because the devil is in the detail. So while there's a lot of kind of task team work done on the framing, I think there's a need for prioritization because there's, you know, one's all over the place. And I think the Global North um, uh, got together pretty early on, even pre COP26, um, pre actually the Carbis Bay announcements that were made in, in, in the UK. There was all, there was a lot of thinking that, that went into it and we're playing catch up. And I'm afraid, and this is a South African comment, I'm afraid from a South African point of view, as the, on the implementation, we've gone from an investment plan to implementation, especially on the energy transition, and we're not thinking very clearly about the precedents that are created and how we're going to actually affect the global south. So I've said a lot here, but um, and I, I'm willing to kind of go into a bit more detail, but let me just um, give others a chance as well to make their contribution. Thank you very much.
strong, but not that strong. <laughs> well, what I say is that uh, going back to this, uh, drawing back from my experience in development uh, as a development practitioner, what the speaker just said is very true. They are very smart, the international organizations and the donors, in creating precedents. So we create at the political level a beautiful window, and then during implementation it becomes something quite different probably of what imagined. It comes to mind the Global Environment Facility, that if you see many of their projects, although they have a significant financial analyze the, the bones, the flesh and bones of the proposals, a humongous amount of money is spent on overhead, on consultancies, on ancillary work, and very little gets to the beneficiaries and to the, uh, and to the, the ecosystems that need to be protected. And in that, they have the complicity, and I don't mean it in a criminal sense, but in, the, in a practical sense, of us in the Global South. Because there is a whole ecosystem created to operate based on the incentives established by these sources of funding. So we need to perhaps review our own uh, colonial mentality, passive colonial mentality, when we go into the into working with these funds, and this loss and damage brings us an opportunity to do that, because it is being created from scratch, and if it goes along the lines that are being proposed by the rich countries, it will become a, a, a parody of itself. So, I think that's why the microphone made noise. Maybe my friends from the north guessed that I was going to say this and they sent some vibrations or something. So any other comments? Yes, please. Uh, identify yourself again. And Thank you. I'm Marcos Wortmann from IDS, Instituto Democracia e Sustentabilidade, from Brazil. And my comment uh, is concerned also the the over, um, the, uh, I'm missing the word in English. Um, the situation that we currently have in the world is that we're fighting for resources, for an emergency, climate emergency that has been already described, that has been already um, clearly um, stated through science for the last 40 years. Although the current situation in the world is that thoroughly since last year we have around 10 wars going around in the world. We have countries that are rising mainly from the BRICS country but also all around the world which are challenging the current order which is an order based on the post uh, World War II, post Cold War institutions and norms and this order clearly does not respond to the balance of power in the world anymore. Therefore, it's being challenged. Nevertheless, this challenge and rise of new actors in the international scene, which is something that is absolutely desirable, is also being done at the cost of the rule of law. And exactly the rule of law that we need as a world in order to state and to define common goals and instead, in many cases, of moving forward to bringing up and creating a new rule of law more adequate, this is being do done through war. And this is something that, unfortunately, we're not capable of competing for resources. So if we just take the amount of resources that have been directed to conflict, rearmament, uh, procurement of weapons, etc etc from the last couple of years from now in a perspective that they are going to rise exponentially in the next years the perspectives are grim and this all comes in perspective of the key core issue that unfortunately is not being tackled which is, which is the security council does not respond to the challenge of world 
governance anymore. And this is going to be fractured and is being currently fractured through old style 20th century geopolitics instead of cooperation, international values, and a new human rights centered environmental science based ethics. And I think this is something that we need urgently to be addressing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment that gives us a geopolitical perspective of this discussion, which again is taking place in a, in a world that has tremendous issues that is not dealing with. It's probably part of the same equation, a world which has a structure that was put together, it worked in some ways for many years and now is no longer adapted to the realities of the planet in many ways. And climate is no exception. So, any other comments? Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Ariane Monteiro. I'm an economist who works with the WWF and the, especially the Board of Finance. Uh, my question is uh, just one provocation about us, uh, the situation of the world now. Uh, we are talking about the Global South Climate Agenda, but unfortunately in the world we are living now in the moment of the right extreme situation, like Netherlands, unfortunately like the US, and we have a challenge, of course, of China. That China is a very, very problem in this moment now with climate agenda. Uh, my question is, where is the coming money of this new agenda and the situation in the world is very hard, you know? Uh, right in, in, in the south, of course, uh, I think in, in, the, in the next year, we have a problem with the multilateral agenda, uh, nationalism, everything will, ha will happen. Uh, my question is, how do you think, uh, uh, where this money is coming to in this new, it's not new, but uh, the situation more extreme? Thank you very much. Now I blow too hard. I mean, so uh, I don't, uh, this is, think is a question for the collective group. Uh, as facilitator, I'll take a first step. The money is there. Look at uh, when the Global North wanted to put some money where the, for uh, issues of their own interest, Ukraine. Ukraine was attacked. The same countries that had been telling us for ages that they did not have an additional 0.1% of their GDP to increase their foreign aid budgets, found the money to buy weapons or distribute significant resources for Ukraine. The same for some internal emergencies or internal issues that emerge in their own countries. The money is there. So uh, it is a question. Also, there is, there is a lot of money in the Global South, and there is a lot of money has been plundered from the Global South. Uh, how, how do you, where do you think many or much of the funds that are undeclared in the Global North come from? And why don't they want us to tell us where that money is com coming from or who the owners of that money are? Also, our countries, I have to say, another issue of the global south, are not pushing that hard. I, I try to get a political economy analysis on why is that, but it's happening. So the money is there. There is liquidity in the world and there is solvency in the world. The issues that we have to mobilize it, one through the political will of the countries of the north, also within the global south. Many of our countries are undertaxed uh, or unfairly taxed. So it's an issue that uh, is, is not as simple as give them more money, although it has to be part of the discussion. And now they have less arguments to tell us there is no money. But there are other issues that we have to bring to the fore that we don't. The illicit financial flows has a half paragraph in the G20 declaration, when perhaps it should be two chapters. If we're talking resources, and the G20, remember, was born to deal with global financial issues originally. It was resurrected in London by Gordon Brown during the financial crisis. But that third rail uh, is just marginally
cleaned up, not even touched. So close brackets. Um, anybody else want to stop? Because my plan is uh, considering the time to give Pilar space for some replies or comments she would like to make, and after that we'll wrap up because lunch is waiting. And I know that uh, food security is a very important goal. It's uh, among the 17 sustainable development goals. I, as a former UN person, I have to not just advocate it, but promote uh, its implementation. So I would like Pilar to, to make some comments. Thank you very much. Jorge uh, and, and, and Aula, even though uh, um, I didn't have the opportunity to say it before, as well as to, to all the participants for, for all these comments, questions. Um, I think they, uh, all, this, all this debate will be critical in order to have um, a document that will be useful in terms of our common objectives. So, so thank you very, very much for that. And, and and thank you to say as always to 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 set the the scenery to to doing this. Um, some uh, yeah, quick reactions to to what I heard. Of course, I I will need many of them are food for thought, so I will need more time to digest. But um, some first reactions, uh, not exhaustive enough. With respect to, to scoping the, the work in terms of climate justice, I can't agree more. And I think that that's something that we can really work more a little bit. Um, and um, that scope from climate justice, climate and just transition and the global south in, in that intersection. So um, even to, to um, try not to avoid or to put in a um, more specific way, the, the traditional struggle and discussion on, on compensation and liability, something that, that we avoid at the very beginning because we said maybe this is this is not worthy uh, to give that discussion now and that can overshadow some, from a pragmatic point of view, um, other, other um, um, discussions that are more specific and we can really um, achieve. Maybe that's uh, my past as, as negotiator that many times when we just, um, you start with that conversation, all the negotiation is blow up. So it's like, okay, from a pragmatic point of view, you don't go there at the beginning, but you really try to go for things that you can achieve. But um, I, that's why I said it's food for thought. I think from all these heads, it's positive maybe to, to, to reconsider the scope from that very strong point of view that I cannot agree more, of course. Um, Another another issue is is uh, on the how um, it's with respect to different scenario and the key players. Um, I I agree it's it's important maybe to to strengthen um, uh, in the work and to understand better which are the different opportunities for Brazil um, um, and and also to see which other. Um, players are critical to avoid this this um, perspective of giving Brazil all the burden, and then all the other countries are just being led by Brazil. Because I don't think that will be useful even for Brazil leadership. So I I agree we need to reconsider and strengthen the role of Brazil and understand better even the this multi uh, level strategy and multi layer strategy. Some some of you mentioned this. Um, well, again, the, the, the relationship between G20 and, and COP30 presidencies, uh, but identify more more players, and, and, and I agree that's important in, in different scenarios. Um, another, another comment uh, some of you made in different words, but I think it's um, something common in may, many interventions, is, is the issue of the Global South and uh, and that many of you see the position of the Global South being, um, um, some of you said, uh, lost weight or is not as is, it, it used to be. So, um, and, and this idea of uh, it's developing countries being, need to re being remember CBDR and, and many other principles of our common understanding from, from decades. So um, I think this many times 
at least I struggle with what needs to be recognized, but at the same time, what we maybe from strategic point of view, we don't, we don't want to focus on that. Many times I, I read pieces focus on the, the differences between the South. And so it's that delicate balance between recognizing that, but at the same time, I don't, I don't like, or I would not like to, to give the document an idea of the South is not what it used to be. So now where we are, so it's, recognize but at the same time from from that point of view to to say we are strong enough at least to have a fund and a funding arrangements on loss and damage that uh two years ago we didn't even dream to have it so we have it even though as as you also said now it's an empty shop and we need to 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 put uh money there and processes and 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 the needs in the center so that delicate balance it's something that that uh, i think we we need to consider carefully how, how we are going to to do that the shift to the right that also some of you mentioned i agree and, and i think that's something that that we can also uh, consider to to mention at the beginning as a contextual fact that is very very important not only the shift to the right but also the relationship between that shift and negationism, that is something that we are dealing with, many of us and our countries, um, in developing countries and in developed countries with different impacts, because in many cases in developing countries is uh, trying to fight for not losing our institutional frameworks, um, the progress that we could uh, done in the past and developed countries is a lot about money and that happened with US and it's very um, uh, simple to see in the Trump era. Um, with respect to the principles of funding, um, I will I will say my my personal point of view is to stick to the principles of the convention if we are talking about the convention and we already have they are in the convention itself and the Paris Agreement all what we need in terms of principles so we can be we can strengthen that we can uh, at the beginning along with the climate justice um, scope and uh, liability and compensation um, with respect to the risking I'm still I'm still struggling um, I I would like to to know better uh, if um, because from my view uh, my, my career is quite related to adaptation so um, very close to adaptation and loss and damage um, so it's my, my question is from a, even a scientific and political point of view um, one of the main opportunities in terms of reducing losses and damages in the future is financing adaptation so um, my first reaction will be that one uh, even though the, the the person that made the message, the the the, um, the the comment, I think it was Penny, um, she referred more at the national level, I think. But I, I would like to 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 reconsider that, and of course, Penny, very happy to to continue the engagement even by by email, if you if you could like. Um, yeah, these are some of my first reactions, but this is really. A very interesting um, exchange. Uh, we have a lot of challenges ahead, and a paper is just an, an, an starting point in order to have this very uh, good discussion and, and how to recognize that, but at the same time to give tools to the different stakeholders and countries related to these negotiations in order to have. Um, the best outcomes we can have in this context that we also need to recognize because then we seek for unicorns that, that we know that we are not going to have. So that again, that balance between the what we really want, what we deserve, what we have to have in terms of the emergency, but at the same time that we know that is possible and a little bit more. Um, yeah, thank you very much again. Pilar, and thank you to all the participants. I would like our colleagues from SAI or IPEA if they want to say something before the close of the session. From my perspective as moderator, the session is over and I give the floor to our colleagues from SAI.
Thank you very much, Jorge. That was fantastic facilitation. Um, yes, so I just want to talk through some logistics now, especially for our online audience. Uh, the groups here physically, uh, we are going to break for lunch now. Uh, we'll be reconvening at 1.30 Brasilia time. Online audience will have to check what that means for you in your country. But it's, it's about an hour and 20 minutes from now. It's about an hour and 20 minutes from now. Um, that's it for the online group. Uh, please do join us again for the afternoon session. For the group physically here, we are going to have a group photo. Um, there will be someone outside the door to direct you. You want the photo up here? Okay, very good. We will do the photo up here. Uh, once the group photo is done, there is a shuttle which will take us to the lunch venue, so be careful of wandering off because <laughs> you might miss lunch. All right, thank you very much.
might um, the two projectors of the session. Uh, one is, of course, uh, Professor Chuang Char from China, which is online, but Dr. Ramsey is the Indian Institute of Dr. Chang uh, online from China. activities uh, we uh, you know the six uh, task forces is very much on and we heard in the morning uh, from the uh, coordinator of uh, the task force 2 of uh, think 20 which covers uh, very much the issues that we are discussing today so <clears throat> a lot of uh, actually hundreds of uh, policy briefs or policy papers are being prepared all across the world on different issues that impinge on uh, the agenda of G20 summit. The theme of this session is about uh, globe, uh, sorry, green technology and it follows uh, from the previous session which focused on loss and damage uh, fund. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation of is a very, very, very critical challenge for the humanities. Whether you live in developed countries of the world or in the global south, it is a challenge for everyone. But it becomes a much bigger and much more pressing and more critical challenge for uh, global south uh, uh, or the countries of the global south because of the two regions that technology and finance that are needed for mitigation of uh, these uh, you know challenges uh, in green transition so to say uh, they are in uh, short supply for uh, the global south, uh, south countries and uh, in the G20 summit under Indian presidency last year. The finance issue was taken up uh, very strongly uh, in the sense that there were a lot of discussions. Prime Minister of India in his capacity as president of uh, G20 India presidency uh, even set up a independent group of experts uh, chaired co-chaired by uh, Professor Larry Summers uh, of United States and Mr. N.K. Singh of India. They looked at all different issues uh, in a uh, you know, very comprehensive manner uh, 
to see how uh, the trillions of dollars that are needed for climate transition, uh, the green uh, technology, sorry, green transition uh, in the global south can be, uh, you know, sort of uh, augmented or uh, deployed and, uh, you know, provided for uh, through some kind of uh, reforms. And this independent uh, expert group came up uh, with a number of suggestions, uh, including uh, for the reform of multilateral development banks. So, so things began to happen on the finance agenda. At least there are some credible proposals on the table. Action is where we are still not there yet, but a uh, lot of thinking and uh, consensus building has taken place. Whether it will lead to concrete uh, results or concrete outcomes in terms of delivery of the potential of these reforms in providing resources, only time will tell. But at least a uh, lot of groundwork has been done. Now, the other uh, important concern is about technology. And without technology, we can only go that, that far. So finance is there, has to be there, and technology has also to be there. Otherwise, how do we mitigate the, uh, the issues of uh, climate change? And there, you know, uh, supply of technology and transfer of technology, both. And in both of these, uh, the north-south uh, dimension comes into play. Because as we know, the geography of innovation is highly asymmetric. Bulk of the uh, innovative capacity and activity is concentrated in countries of the global north. And that means uh, the transfer uh, of that uh, to southern countries uh, has to be facilitated and facilitated in a manner that it is affordable. It, I mean, you, you can say that, well, technology is available at the, uh, at the terms that the suppliers will determine. That is not what is needed. What is needed is uh, the access to technologies or green technologies on affordable terms, you know, so that uh, developing countries or global south can really benefit from it. So uh, that is where I think the discussion on green technology, access to them, supply of them uh, becomes very critical, very fundamental. And uh, I'm happy that uh, this South African Institute of International Affairs started this uh, uh, project on, uh, on the uh, uh, strengthening of the Global South's climate agenda and uh, green technology is part of the two issues uh, that are being addressed in that from framework. And this co chair, uh, the, 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 the group is co chaired by uh, Dr. Karim Al Nui. Uh, he is not able to join us uh, and, and me. And so we had uh, been uh, engaged uh, over the past uh, several months with colleagues uh, in uh, South African Institute of International Affairs uh, by, uh, with the, uh, you know, Alex and uh, uh, Luanda and Jordan and all other uh, members of their team uh, to uh, first uh, prepare some concept notes, then invite proposals, and and then uh, the p policy briefs, uh, two of them were commissioned. So in this session, <coughs> we will discuss the work in progress on these two proposals for preparing policy briefs. And one of them is by Dr. Humphrey uh, Nogu. Uh, am I pronouncing it? Well, or uh, it's Njogu. Okay. Yeah, Kenyan. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, Humphrey, 
I think uh, we can begin with you and then I will inv invite uh, Professor Chang from China for the second presentation. So how much time you think you will need uh, for your presentation? Maybe 15, but not more. Uh, okay, 15 minutes. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, please. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Kumala, for actually introducing to us what uh, this subject is, uh, is all about. Uh, my name is Humphrey Jogo. I work with a public think tank in Kenya. It's called Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, KIPRA. Uh, we've been um, um, contracted uh, to do a policy brief on the state of play on green technologies in Africa. You know, just trying to understand uh, what uh, we are doing uh, from an African point of view. And the reason is, uh, okay, we've, we've, we haven't been able to do for the, for the global south. So we only picked uh, Africa because it's, it's also a uh, good representation of what is happening uh, at the sound, south. Um, maybe I think, yeah, but I think I can be changing. Yeah, um, the outline of my presentation is on uh, one. I will just give you the background of uh, uh, this work. I uh, will also give you the current uh, situation where we are, uh, outline the issues that we are facing, and finally give, the, give you recommendations that uh, we are putting forward. Remember this is at the preliminary. We haven't actually been able to farm up on this. Um, Yeah, this is much much better. Um, sorry for for the for the for the for the interruption. Um, just provide the background of uh, where where why why uh, we we are doing this. Uh, we all know that uh, Africa uh, is actually the first fastest growing um, uh, continent with a huge population. Um, but at the same time, we also have the lowest rates when it comes to access to uh, to energy globally. So this is a big, big motivator to why this, uh, this, uh, this piece of policy brief is important. Uh, again, six, about 600 million uh, uh, people in Africa lack access to electricity. And the trend is also like it to also to worsen by 2050. About actually uh, 1.2 billion will not be having access to electricity if we don't do something on this. Um, more importantly, when it comes to cooking, um, you know, uh, cooking technologies, about 970 million lack access to these clean cooking uh, 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 technologies. And the same will also happen when it comes to, um, when it comes to 2050, about 1.8 uh, billion people will not have uh, this. Now, um, again, looking at uh, why energy is key, uh, and this is actually connected to industrialization, so as a continent, uh, we also want to move uh, with others globally so that we're also able to, uh, to, uh, to, to manufacture our products, to grow our economy, and therefore powering our, energy, uh, powering our, our industries is also very important. Um, and the good thing is that uh, in Africa, there's a lot of resources when it comes to renewable resources. But the bad side is that uh, if we don't invest in uh, efficient energy systems, then again we also learn a risk of uh, depleting even, even the natural resources that we're seeing, in, uh, they are inhabited. Um, the previous speakers talked about um, uh, about 3% of uh, global energy, uh, sorry, global energy related carbon dioxide come from uh, the continent. But yet the region, the continent is the one that actually, actually experienced quite a lot when it comes to uh, to the effects of climate change. Um, sorry, I have to move on with this. Now, and therefore now switching to uh, to more renewable uh, technology is very, very important so that we can, one, we can be able to really create that environment that is uh, conducive for the, for, the, for the population in the continent. And more importantly also, um, 
you know, we also seem to be um, serving to the commitments that have actually been uh, made uh, at the continent level and also at the international level. Um, again, the good thing with the, when we invest in the renewable energies, about 4 million uh, additional jobs will actually be created. And this we definitely need that uh, we have to invest in our economic integration and international partnership. They are so key. So Africa itself or you know, the, the countries within the, the continent may not be able to do much if we don't get support from especially from a, uh, you know, uh, other countries that are also within uh, this space of the South. Um, now, I have a diagram here which is just uh, showing the state of uh, renewable technologies globally. And you can see here, uh, we are, you know, uh, we have some countries, especially also in, uh, in uh, the good thing is that here you're able to see the, the global south. You can be able to see countries the way they are embracing renewable uh, energies. But we are on a different level. Some countries have done quite well, others are not doing quite well. And therefore, this is a serious, uh, serious uh, concern that we need to, uh, to address. Um, looking at the status of uh, renewable energy uh, in, the, in the continent, you can uh, see that um, um, definitely there will be, uh, there will be a demand. Uh, and this is based on uh, what is actually, we've actually corrected the data on the, on the same. 2020, we started a uh, little, but we can see the projection. Uh, all the way to 2050, we are seeing demand for this renewable uh, energy. You know, it's very, very important. So I think that's just maybe so. Uh, so 2020, we were, were seeing we were, uh, you know, um, out of uh, all the uh, energy projects, 25 were renewable. But we are looking at by 2050, 90% of what uh, we'll be doing uh, from an African point of view should actually be uh, should actually be renewable. Now, having known that, um, it's also very important also to just maybe to take note of uh, um, that uh, if you look at also specific, uh, you know, um, uh, energy sources, the same, this is actually the same thing. We are seeing uh, uh, there is that upward uh, growth uh, because resources, I mean, uh, this 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 energy work will be required but of, of importance to note is that uh, when it comes to electricity so there is a demand which is projected to grow to grow by six by six times uh, which is good but now the challenge that uh, we also need to be much aware of is that one as we continue demanding on uh, electricity we still have a huge population that is not connected to uh, to uh, to electricity so you're talking about rural population do not have uh, access to uh, to energy uh, sources. Um, more importantly, even when we're also generating this power, our our energy infrastructure, they are very outdated. Uh, and no wonder when there is uh, some uh, way, you know, change of pattern of weather, like rain, you find that there are a lot of, you know, the number of uh, out power outages actually, they increase. And these are unscheduled power outages, definitely that uh, uh, will actually also affect how we uh, we are doing things. Now, um, I also have a you know just demonstration of the same, just to show you, uh, you know, we you know the efforts that are also going um, in the continent, uh, and you can see here, for instance, you can be able to see uh, huge projects uh, for wind, uh, wind power. Solar, you can see here. Uh, again, I think uh, you know uh, some countries actually doing quite well, but we also have a lot that are not doing so well. Uh, almost, you know, very, very much more when it comes to green hydrogen, hydropower, and all that. Now, the key message that we are seeing from uh, this diagram is that uh, um, yes, Africa is uh, well endowed in terms of uh, natural resources, but we are yet to exploit what is actually, I mean, uh, the resources that we do have there. More importantly, I just want to say that uh, about 40% of the global results of uh, cobalt, mangri, uh, manganese, and pre, uh, pre platinum, which are also very key ingredient when it comes to renewable energies, eh? they come from Africa, but we do not actually use some of them. Actually, they are uh, the exported. Now, um, now, very quickly, I just want maybe to talk about uh, 
demand and supply of green technologies. So the demand for green uh, uh, technology, uh, just like what I just mentioned uh, earlier alone, is set to continue growing and it will grow significantly. Um, yes, as we, this is also happening globally. So we are talking about a continent where, again, we haven't been able to actualize universal, universal access to energy. So we find that uh, we're also going to be left behind. Again, when it, th when it comes to supply, the, now the supply side, si side of, uh, of this, uh, we can be able to say that uh, we have uh, a few key suppliers of uh, renewable energy technologies. I think that uh, Professor Kumar talked about this. We have a few countries that are actually driving this space. And of course, you all know China is uh, a key player in this space. We have uh, US, Japan, uh, Germany. They drive uh, these renewable technologies, um, which is a good thing. And again, also, also uh, you know, a bad thing because uh, as a you know, as a developing uh, you know uh, continent, then it means if we don't have the means of uh, uh, importing this, definitely. Um, Actualizing universal access will still remain uh, a distant, you know, a distant dream that uh, we still need to reflect on. Now, um, more important, I just want to want to say that uh, much of the materials that are actually come, if, you know, that actually contribute to the development of these uh, green uh, technologies, actually come from uh, from Africa. So, and therefore, I think we have no reason uh, to remain behind and all that. So, I have picked. Uh, a few industries just to demonstrate that um, you know the situation where we are in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, this. Um, so the first industry that I just want I have actually just picked is transport, and uh, particularly we're looking at the aspect of uh, e-mobility, electric vehicles. Um, so sorry, my data is a little bit outdated. I think yeah, I got this from um, it's a global report. I think they have uh, they were able. I think they have done up to twenty twenty. One or twenty-two. Now, um, if you look at this, you find that uh, yes, we can talk about uh, e-vehicles for, especially like you. Okay, for China, you can see actually it's uh, because they've actually done quite well. But when you talk about uh, when you look at uh, Africa the, or the the South, global South, then you find that uh, actually we actually lump you know lump together with the other. So that means that uh, our contribution is too small. And I happen to, you know, we happen to look at the, what could be the reasons why we actually left behind. Um, so we do have some uh, challenges. And just before I go to the challenges, eh, we have data from a uh, statistica, uh, which uh, again also telling us that the status are uh, per country. And I picked a few countries. So South Africa, uh, and this is data that covers up to 2022. Um, there were about a thousand uh, full electric vehicles, not hybrid, but uh, full electric vehicles. Kenya at that time also had about 350. I know the situation may have changed because of uh, maybe one, two years difference. Um, looking at country like uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopia has really decided this is their way. They are fully embracing uh, EVs or electric vehicles. Um, but the challenge is that, uh, again, we still continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to get is that one, uh, we do not manufacture these e vehicles, so we have to import them. So, definitely, that will also mean that uh, we are somehow left behind. Again, we also, when you also look at even our infrastructure, again, uh, in as much as I am capable of buying a EV, you know, an electric vehicle, I may not use it in my country. And the reason is because there is inadequate infrastructure when it comes to maybe perhaps to charging it. The cost of electricity still remain to be very expensive uh, because majority of the uh, population there uh, they even struggling to uh, to do the uh, to pay the bill for just for the light only so leave alone for for charging and again um, incentives uh, uh, to encourage adoption of such technologies I think uh, we still need to do quite a lot uh, and more importantly there is also an absence of a policy in the regulatory framework to guide development of these kind of particular technology. Now, uh, next, I picked uh, just an aspect of solar, uh, solar energy. And uh, we can see here from uh, this diagram. So 
despite that we actually have a lot of resources sunlight is quite a lot so we have only been able to install a capacity of one, only one percent um and the reasons is because one uh if you talk to uh many people they will tell you that uh, the panels the, the solar panels are expensive because they have to be imported uh more important again uh, the social taxes issues of taxes uh, when we import, government is also an, it's an avenue of generating more money from this. Um, again, um, I talked about we have fewer local solar plants that uh, perhaps maybe would drive the prices to come down. And I think uh, all these resources actually contribute, uh, you know, for, for us not being able to really um, take advantage of this. Uh, available technologies for making solar uh, or even not just solar but many also many other equipments and therefore helping us to meet the the energy demands uh, again when you also look at uh, uh, a sector like agriculture agriculture relies so much on the um, these green technologies and the agriculture is a backbone of the um, African economy so we are talking about facilities that really require renewable energy like you know the the cold chains where you're keeping a uh, food products greenhouse farming you still need uh, the same uh, green technologies uh, contract farming um, irrigation transport and all that you still need this um, our research indicate that only few industries actually dedicated local industries dedicated for agricultural technologies and this is actually also again also worsening the situation and um, looking at uh, sm climate smart agriculture there is low application of the same and the reason is because uh, one uh, is that we don't have we don't have uh, adequate skills uh, for the climate uh, uh, cli for the climate smart agriculture more importantly when it comes to accessing and affordability of power yes technology could be there but uh, it's not applicable to all the areas in there especially in the rural areas so some of these technologies also would also mean that we rely on the internet digital connectivity which again is also a big barrier to uh, to, 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 the, to the to the to the to the rural population and uh, therefore this constraint or appears to be a big barrier to adoption of the uh, these renewable technologies that uh, we have now um now second last uh, um industry that uh, we also looked at uh, is health so health um really uh relies so much on the renewable energies talk about um, radiology health treatment vaccine storage waste management I mean, there is huge. I mean, a wide range of application of uh, renewable technologies in the health sector. Uh, yet, you find that uh, accessing the energy itself is an issue. The technology is also an issue, and I just also happen to look at just maybe the ownership of nuclear power. So, the research reactors that uh, are so key, especially when it comes to treatment of uh, cancer and related, uh, uh, you know, uh, diseases. You find that uh, only very few countries uh, have actually been able to do this. And when you dig deeper to this, you understand that it takes a lot of resources to do this. It's capital intensive. You also need to get skills, uh, import skills to do this. And, uh, you know, we have to actually to look at ways of uh, looking at all this and uh, moving forward. Now, um, there are good things when it comes to startups, energy startups, that are bringing in new ways new knowledge new uh, techniques of addressing issues um, and especially driven by the digital technology um, i we've picked uh, a number of them uh, there is one that is uh, offering a uh, solar solar uh, i mean payment eh? actually supporting the people to pay solar solar power it's called mcopa uh, which i think is proving to be a quite innovative way of addressing uh, issues of, uh, of, uh, of energy in, in Africa. Uh, there is also the mobile gas where you pay as you use. So you're only paying, you're given a cylinder of gas and you're only able to pay, uh, you know, based on the amount that you actually, you've paid. So amazing things are happening. Uh, but again, you also find that uh, 
uh, when it comes to scaling this up, it's an issue. So yes, the technologies are there, but scaling up these technologies again uh, would uh, mean that we do more. Um, support, getting that support, especially for the, the startups and the innovators, has always been a, a big issue that we need to think about. Uh, infrastructure I talked about, which is actually uh, cutting a close. Now, um, I would also want to say that uh, despite all this, um, I think really working on reliability of power will still remain to be a challenge that uh, we all need to think about. Now, Kipra did uh, a study. We um, did a survey, especially to see uh, how um, manufacturing farms are affected by power outages. And this is just the selected farms that we did. And we did up to, you know, just we did a study of five years. And you can see that um, when it comes to when there are power outages, companies or institutions or these manufacturing farms are really experiencing, uh, you know, huge losses. And this is just an illustration of just the same. So this means that uh, if they were also to rely on some uh, renewable energies, then definitely that would also mean that uh, uh, they will also need to spend more. And all that I think uh, you know, and I think the same thing is also explained here. Uh, so the next slide again is also looking at the total revenue loss for scheduled and unscheduled outages. So and the reason is just just to show you that reliability of power is is actually a big issue. So here we are looking at what it means when you have a scheduled outage and when you have unscheduled outage, and definitely that it's actually telling us when you have an unscheduled power outage, uh, losses are far, far more than when actually you have been uh, told to do the same. So we also, again, also asked a question on the same, on uh, just to understand the share of electricity cost and self-generation in operation expenditure. So I mean, so because power outages, they are so common. So manufacturing farms have resorted to having their solar, you know, having a solar panel or able, they are able to generate their own electricity. So, and this is like how it responded across various uh, industries. Eh? So you can see here building and uh, manufacturing. You can see how they, they actually see treating the cost of power. It's about 4% of total cost. Uh, but where we found uh, to, I mean, across, I think across all these, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have, you know, uh, industries actually expressing a concern that with unreliability of electricity and investing in these uh, renewable technologies, I get definitely that, you know, that's additional cost that, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing firms will need to spend on. Now, um, now, this is not taking back us now to the investment that we need to, to make in, uh, in this renewable energy. Um, now, um, there's a study that was commissioned, uh, and it does some projection of uh, the energy, the African energy investment that, that need to be, to be made. So you can see here, as we move all the way to 2050, there's more resources that need to be, to be put here. And as, as we plan to do this, we all know that, uh, especially where we are, uh, we have, I think, to get a zero carbon electric grid, I think it's very common. I mean, it's not common, eh? So meaning that even if you have this electric grid, most, most of them are actually generating uh, you know, carbon. Again, more important is that we have, uh, we also rely on uh, outdated distribution systems. So in as much as we also investing in, in, our, in our improving our electricity distribution and all that using better technologies, we still need also to really overhaul the system in terms of generation um, to the distribution, to the connecting our consumers and also making sure that what is also being consumed, uh, we are also using this. Uh, we are, use, we are using a, uh, you know better technologies to do this. Um, so we needed to really invest quite a lot in, when it comes to uh, to this. Now uh, I have a number of uh, just issues that I just want maybe to. Yeah. Can you wrap it up? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this should actually be my second last uh, slide. Now. Um, I've been able to summarize the, the issues and challenges that uh, um, African continent is facing 
all the way from I mean it's, we have all the issues um, cutting across inadequate energy infrastructure, affordability and adoption of uh, these green technologies, uh, skills, capital, awareness, incentives. We have competing interests. And uh, again, when there's also disruption of power, you know, relying so much on what is produced from outside, uh, then we have COVID, we have Ukraine war, we are not able to actually to really support our environment. So um, there are a lot of issues that we need to be, uh, you know, to take into account. Last but not least, I just want to mention uh, a factor or a barrier that was mentioned uh, in the beginning, limited data. So in as much as we want to tell our story about uh, what is happening, uh, data is actually being kept by the, by, by, by the North, you know, by the global North. So meaning that we are not also able to really tell our story well. So this is an issue that uh, we, uh, we are facing. Now, um, my last slide. Um, what are the recommendations that uh, we are putting in the brief? A number of them. One, we need to market uh, the, uh, the continent. We have always been uh, seen as, uh, you know, not things, you know, the, the continent, you know, bad things are you not know, reported. But there are also many good things that, uh, that are also happening there. So marketing from a positive point of view need to happen. Um, enhancing our infrastructure, if there is anything that you can do, all these green technologies who still need to depend on a uh, well laid down infrastructure. Um, when it comes to the transfer of, of uh, technologies, so especially when we have also imported, we also need to structure this in a way that it's very clear that uh, this is the take or this is the contribution that uh, also the locals are also going to, uh, to, 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 to make. Um, more collaboration and networking, especially within the global south, is very important. Protection of um, uh, uh, of intellectual property, especially the products that are actually uh, designed and also produced within within the continent, that also need to be to be taken into account. Investing more in R and D is very important, and uh, again also um, funding our innovators would also be very important. Last but not least, also building skills would also be very important. So in a nutshell, uh, we have, uh, this is actually what we've been able to put, uh, it's a policy brief, uh, just to tell uh, a story of, uh, there are a lot of things happening in Africa, uh, lots of resources that are there, but you still need to do more so that we can be able to really take advantage of uh, the technologies that are there and uh, you know improve energy access uh, in the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Humphrey, for putting on the table a very comprehensive sort of survey of uh, what uh, constrains uh, African continent in respect to access to uh, green transition, green technologies, and all that. And he went sector by sector, uh, you know, uh, in terms of e-mobility, e solar, uh, agriculture applications, health applications, startups, and, uh, you know, uh, different sectors, different constraints, and all that. What comes out is that there are a lot of, uh, the, the, the continent has a lot of resources and a uh, lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, potential of applications, but uh, the lagging behind because of uh, the access to uh, these technologies is limited. Uh, the generally owned and controlled by the countries of the North. And uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, summary of these uh, issues, uh, he finds that affordable adoption of technologies uh, is limited, uh, including local technology content is very low. And he makes a number of very important recommendations, including uh, highlighting or advocating market uh, uh, marketing uh, the uh, continent for green technologies, strengthen IPR uh, protection, invest in R&D, including, uh, you know, collaborative research, uh, enhancing skills and structured 
in technology transfer. So, so very sort of very comprehensive overview of the issues and uh, how to address the challenges. I think uh, we uh, are all uh, sort of, uh, you know, benefited from uh, your presentation. Uh, and I, what I find is that uh, most of the issues that affect uh, the African continent in respect of this clean energy, clean uh, transition or green transition, very similar to uh, what is faced by other continents uh, of the global south, uh, maybe degrees, uh, you know, a little bit less or more, uh, depending upon where you are. But uh, I could relate most of the issues you have raised to my part of the world, uh, South Asia. There are also similar kind of issues, maybe a bit lesser in degree, uh, but they are all there. Now, uh, with that, uh, let us turn to the second presentation of this session, uh, which is by Professor Chang of China Agricultural University, who is joining online. Are you uh, there, Dr. Uh, Professor Chang? Yes, Hi. I see Hi. Good afternoon. on the screen. So, yeah. can, can you, you hear could. me? Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. You have the floor, or you have the screen, as <laughs> okay. <Kirk> said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for uh, for for this. Uh, no, we can't hear you. Oh, you are you, you muted? Hear me? No. I, can you hear me now? No, you, you still can't hear you. So, oh. hold on. Uh, tech is working. Okay. Is it is it better now? Can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? I um. Actually, I can hear you. Maybe increasing well, the know. volume. Uh. Okay, is it better? I think that's not the not not a problem from my side. Can you yeah, hear me? yeah. Now we can hear you perfectly, loud and clear. So please go ahead. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very kind invitation and. Uh, yeah, my um, uh, share will be based on the policy brief I prepared uh, for, for uh, with um, arranged actually by colleagues from SIA, um, uh, Professor Alex. So this is a very Chinese perspective. I'm not sure if it can feel uh, provide some knowledge. Um, and um, yeah, just following the, the schedule as mentioned, uh, required by by them. So I will just say the background, uh, the achievements and modality and challenges and recommendations. Uh, first, you know, um, I want to say climate change is a global threat. Uh, however, the impact of uh, climate change uh, distributes unfairly among. Uh, different countries, uh, you know, especially for those countries who are yet achieving industrialization, they are suffering from the climate change most. Uh, but for some, they have to make the hard choice of, um, I call it, I like to call it pre-industrial deindustrialization. So this is um, something very uh, uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, for these countries, probably, uh, you know, green industrialization or green technology could be a way out to tackle uh, the, the, the challenge. And um, as the largest country from the global south, we, we usually say China is a member of the global south. You know, China has experienced the rapid industrialization and urbanization in the last four decades. Um, of course, China also suffered a lot from uh, this rapid development like resource and environmental degradation. Uh, and um, climate change has become an issue of great concern among Chinese policymakers. Um, since 2015, through a series of strategies focusing on 
high quality green low carbon development, China has achieved notable achievements in green transition. And most recently, China has committed to peak carbon emission by 2030 and reach carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, green technology research and development application and promotion has uh, played a major part in China's rapid green transition. Um, and uh, we can say, you know, China has rapid, rapidly become a power, powerful uh, force in green technology, innovation and um, employment. Um, taking the initiative in the field of renewable energy, China has become a major powerhouse leading the global development transition. China's investment in clean energy has ranked world number one for many consecutive years, and its installed capacity to hydropower, wind, photovoltaic power generation um, have also been in the leading position, which means the whole industrial chain is advancing in tandem. Um, and through aid, trade, and the investment, uh, China successfully positioned itself as a key player in addressing climate challenges in the global south, while adhering to the principles of south-south cooperation, mutual benefits exerted from the engagement are obvious. However, you know, concerns about transparency, environmental and social impacts and China's geopolitical motivation have influenced the progress of projects as well as the image of China. Uh, so in this policy brief, we are going to provide an overview, brief overview on China's engagement with um, other countries in the global south in the uh, field of green development under the framework of South-South cooperation and the challenge and recommendations to enhance the effect effectiveness of this engagement uh, will be analyzed and proposed. Uh, first, we know uh, promoting green development has been prioritized in China's inter international uh, development initiatives. Uh, for example, the upgraded version of BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, now is called a high quality and a green BRI or BRI 2.0, you know, with a major focus to address uh, the negative impact of um, these projects on uh, social, economic and environmental governance issues. And um, also, you know, climate change and green development was listed as one of the eight priority areas of uh, cooperation in the Global Development Initiative and a series of regional forums, including the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, uh, FOCAC, uh, and other uh, regional forums emphasize the importance of green development cooperation. And as of November 2023, China has signed 50 MOUs with 41 developing countries in the global south to provide support to tackle the issues related to climate change. Um, you know, these projects include four uh, low carbon demonstration zones uh, in Africa, different African countries, and 77 mitigation and adaptation projects, and also uh, capacity building projects for uh, 2,400 government officials and experts from 120 countries. So these are uh, the, the, the efforts. Uh, you know, in terms of modalities, we say, uh, expert scholars and technicians are dispatched um, and received by China for mutual learning, uh, experience sharing and technology exchange. Um, for example, a Chinese expert team in Ethiopia helped the host country uh, build a photovoltaic power station um, and uh, conducted quite a lot of training and demonstration. Um, and also, China's green technology cooperation has been carried out under the multilateral mechanisms, um, you know, such as United Nations, G20, and a BRICS mechanism. 
um, sharing experience and technology and jointly addressing the challenge of climate change. Um, for example, China initiated the establishment of a green finance study group under the G20 framework to promote green finance, uh, jointly formulating green technology cooperation plans um, and clarifying cooperation priorities and objectives. Yeah, there are quite a lot of uh, projects uh, conducted by China and the UNDP, China uh, and ASEAN countries, and also uh, 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 under the uh, China Africa Green Development Fund. Um, and also, you know, business participation is an important feature of China's green cooperation uh, in the global south. Uh, Chinese government and enterprises provide financial support um, uh, in these partner countries uh, for green technology research, development, and application. Yeah, besides China Africa Development Fund, the Silk, uh, China Silk Road Fund also supports Chinese enterprises in green technology investment and cooperation in developing countries. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I hear some background noise. Go coming, oh. where somebody else is also speaking. So, oh. can you mute the other one? So, please yeah. go go ahead, please. Uh, Dr. Yeah, I, I want to mention, you know, uh, China Brazil joint venture pro, um, uh, actually produces. Uh, electric vehicles uh, for the Brazilian uh, market. That, that is a very successful um, uh, uh, joint venture project. And also China India um, company, joint company, joint venture company develops and produce wind power equipment for the Indian market. And of course, there are some uh, uh, cooperation between Chinese enterprises and the South African enterprises, you know, they work together to conduct research and development on carbon uh, capture and storage technology cooperation and uh, developed a global leading technology. Um, so these are some su successful um, uh, cases for business participation. Uh, and China's green uh, technology transfer greatly contributes to the trade and the investment in green development between China and partner countries. Uh, for example, Chinese photovoltaic modules have been exported to more than 100 countries and regions, and the Chinese wind power equipment has been um, exported to more than 70 countries um, and regions. Uh, you know, helping developing countries to increase the utilization rate of wind power. Uh, of course, this also benefits uh, China uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, Chinese green capital um, has um, also, you know, gone global with China's green technology diffusion. Uh, investment in wind farms in Indonesia, biomass power plants in Brazil, uh, helping partner countries reduce their dependence on, on fossil fuels. Yeah, likewise, this trade and investment has also greatly facilitated uh, the application and the promotion of China's green technology transfer. So one thing uh, worth to mention is that China's green technology is not limited to uh, green energy and the traffic sector. Uh, agriculture development um, has also uh, being prioritized. Um, I, I can just provide one example, you know, um, the genes hot technology developed by National Engineering Research Center of Fuji Agriculture and Forestry University, um, uh, you know, allowing smallholder farmers to grow mushrooms from dried chopped grasses without chopping down trees and damaging the environment. Um, and this project were promoted and applied um, that this technology um, uh, were applied in 17 countries in, in, in the global south. Rwanda, I, I heard that the one in Rwanda has been very successful. Um, you know, without a ch uh, doubt, China is now a global leader 
in renewable energy investment and deployment uh, due to its efforts in, address, in addressing climate change um, issues both at home and abroad. Um, as its global footprints on green development expanded, China's endeavors to be a global leader uh, also face significant challenges in both uh, narratives and realities. Uh, the first challenge I, I would like to say is the, the win-win approach, uh, you know, with the objective of simultaneous pursuit of economic benefits and the environmental sustainability um, sometimes is hard to accomplish. Uh, for China, who always consider itself as a member of the Global South, uh, and world's largest South, South cooperation provider, win-win scenario is a more feasible and sustainable way to drive economic growth as well as to promote environmental sustainability in partner countries. But how to balance the two objectives um, sometimes is very thorny. Um, critics point out that pursuing economic growth often overshadowed the environmental agenda and dubbed China's new ambition as green mercantilism. And second uh, challenge is the gap between commitments and impacts. Um, it's, it's large in the short term. Um, take BRI as an example. Uh, we see BRI initiated in 2013, uh, encompassing a network of roads, railroads, ports, uh, and pipelines aims to enhance regional connectivity and embrace a brighter economic future for all countries along the line. Uh, has already involved infrastructure development and investment in more than 70 countries and international organizations um, in the last 10 years. Um, the, the footprint of such a vast project has raised crucial questions about environmental sustainability and responsible governance um, uh, in, in the past few years. You know, of course, in, uh, most recently, in order to address these risks, China has introduced concepts like the Green Silk Road and high quality BRI and has pledged to follow principles of green development and made commitment to fund green energy projects such as hydroelectric power plants and solar farms. However, the impacts of these new investments cannot make up the historical score and critics suspect the reality might be a departure from these commitments as the environmental degradation, pollution, and resource overuse still exist in some ongoing projects. And the third one is technical barriers in mismatch of accounting and auditing principles. Yeah, these technical barriers, you know, make China a lagger in yeah, ESG disclosure, uh, transparency and accountability issues persist um, in yeah, many Chinese overseas development finance. Um, lack of transparency in project agreements, financing terms, and insufficiently rigorous environmental and social impact assessments on Chinese development projects were also criticized. Uh, some large-scale infrastructure projects, particularly hydropower, have been linked to issues like displacement of communities, disrupted ecosystems, and conflicts over land rights and resource use. Um, you know, which often leads to halt and stop of these mega projects. And the fourth one, of course, geopolitical tensions and the competition between China and the West to put many countries in the global south in dilemma when cooperating with China, uh, facing with the complexities of this global environment, China's green technology outreach is um, inevitably entangled in broader geopolitical competition. Uh, Western rivalries often portray Chinese green projects as a tool to extend China's influence rather than solely motivated by climate or developmental concerns. And to compete with China, some Western nations initiated their own green development initiatives in the global south, which is a good thing. Um, as they may bring more options for the host countries. However, you know, um, demonizing Chinese projects are also 
concurrently appear with these uh, computation. So this is the 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 bad sides, the downsides of the computation. Yeah, last but not least, the limited local capacity, uh, as mentioned by Humphrey, you know, it's still the largest bottleneck for the sustainability of the green projects. Um, uh, you know, a mismatch exists between sophisticated technologies deployed and the local ability to fully operate and maintain them, leading to reliance on external expertise and many critics raised the concerns over the sustainability of China's green projects uh, in the global south. So, um, of course, this also include um, the, 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 the poor infrastructure uh, and other issues. So based on these challenges, I uh, try to make the following recommendations to maximize its positive impacts of China's green technology uh, programs um, while mitigating risks. Um, you know, I think both China and partner countries need to take actions um, from, from the following aspects. Uh, first and foremost, you know, keep confidence a year and make concrete measures to standardize the South-South cooperation while adhering to its fundamental principles of reciprocity and solidarity, as these principles are key to materialize decolonization and avoid near colonization. Uh, in this aspect, partner countries' ownership and agency should be emphasized in formulating the policies, implementing the projects, and monitoring the impacts of these projects. I'm not sure if, if I'm clear about this. So South-South cooperation should be, um, you know, adhered, principles should be here, adhered, uh, even from the perspective of the partner countries, uh, although it faces some challenges. Uh, but it's key to uh, to 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 um, uh, maintain this kind of equal partnership. Second, China should invest in data recording and collection on China's green development efforts in the global south and release the periodic reports to increase transparency and enhance accountability of different actors. Uh, by doing this, I think the myths fabricated by mis or disinformation on some projects can be refuted, while the re realities of misconducts on environmental degradation can be corrected on time. Uh, China's commitment to upholding the highest environmental and social standards in its overseas projects is essential for credibility and long-term success. Um, the third one, for Chinese enterprises participating in green development projects in the global south, Technical barriers on ESG disclosure uh, and meeting other global standards needs to be uh, dismantled as soon as possible to enhance its computation capability and long-term profitability. Uh, fortunately, this issue has been paid attention to by uh, scholars, policymakers, as well as, as, as well as the project implementers uh, within China. Um, you know, many discussions on the topic trajectory, um, uh, on the logic trajectories and the challenges of ESG disclosure were conducted um, and alignment with the internationally recognized framework and standards will enhance China's standing as a responsible player and um, global leader. Uh, fourth, to ease geopolitical anxieties and foster more collaborative environment um, is also very important. China should deepen its engagement with multilateral frameworks um, on uh, sustainable development. These include initiatives like the UN's um, SDG goals and uh, climate financing mechanisms. Um, of course, collaborating with traditional players uh, including multinational organizations, can not only contribute to burden sharing for uh, development finance, as well as for blaming, uh, but also enhance mutual learning. Uh, lastly, a focus on genuine impact for technology transfer is extremely important. Uh, this should include and go beyond uh, the basic skills such as installation and training courses. A partnership on research and development, 
with the ambition to empower local innovation ecosystems um, in the global south should be promoted, as mentioned by the previous uh, speaker, you know, to help those uh, startup enterprises to incubate uh, the local enterprises are extremely important for the success of these uh, kind of cooperation. Okay, I just stop here. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, someone said something? No. Yeah, uh, for uh, again, a very comprehensive overview of uh, uh, the Chinese perspective on uh, the uh, green technology, and you have uh, shared how China has very rapidly uh, emerged as a you know country with a lot of uh, technology accumula accumulation, green industrialization, and uh, moving towards uh, a higher quality of uh, you know the the, the transition and uh, the. Uh, also, how uh, China has tried to help uh, other developing countries in the context of South-South cooperation in building, in helping their uh, own transition through transfer of uh, equipment, uh, assistance, capacity building, uh, establishing joint ventures, and uh, you know, uh, helping the partner countries to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels. And uh, then you have also concluded with some uh, recommendations uh, in kind of South-South uh, uh, cooperation adhering to equal partnership principles and also uh, helping local, uh, you know, helping to build local ecosystems in partner countries, including local enterprises, capacities and also. So all of these are very important. Uh, elements of uh, the uh, transition of the global south towards uh, you know uh, the net zero goals and uh, clean and green transition so uh, with that we have uh, heard our two presenters for this session now i like to throw the floor open uh, and also those who are joining uh, online uh, so, who wants to challenge our two speakers? Yes, Alex, go ahead, please. And then I see you. Alex here, first. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for those for those two presentations. Um, and and Chuan Hong, uh, I just do want to note it's. I think it's two or three in the morning where you are. So we really do appreciate uh, you making making the time. Uh, you certainly don't don't show it. <laughs> you look <laughs> very engaged. And she was as energetic as she could be exactly. <laughs> any time of the day. Um, so just just two things, uh, Humphrey. I think maybe from the African perspective, but this is very relevant for China, for Latin America, uh, the critical minerals uh, debate. Um, we know that the Africa region and other source countries with significant critical mineral reserves want to move up green, green technology value chains um, and argue for increased value addition. We do see, both from China and now increasingly from the US and the EU, a willingness to engage and respond to that agenda. But certainly from, from what I've observed on the African continent is that these uh, investments in, in value addition and processing are, are often just the very first stage of, of moving from raw ore to concentrate, which then in any event gets exported. Um, so, uh, and that certainly isn't the ambition for the African countries. They are thinking much further up the value chain in terms of components manufacturer and, and even finished goods, battery manufacturers, so on and so forth. So this, this kind of tension in narratives is, is something I've observed and I'd invite you to reflect on that in the context of North-South and South-South cooperation around green technology. And then, uh, Shamal, uh, maybe one aspect I think that um, 
that didn't come up but that would, I think is going to be increasingly important, especially thinking about China's expertise and, and dominance, in fact, of, of, of green technology value chains, is, is, is the circular economy aspect of it, and recycling, and management, recapitalization when it comes to batteries and solar power, and I think that's something very interesting to explore. The geopolitical aspect is, of course, very interesting, and everyone's watching that very carefully. Um, you know, you made a remark that, you know, uh, people observe or, or perhaps say that China's engagement in energy and green technology is not solely motivated by climate and environmental concerns and that there's a component of, of national interest at play, but, you know, I would say that, that that's pretty much true for, for any external actor seeking to engage with um, with partners in certainly in our region and, and other areas of the global south and that uh, recognizing that there is a component of national interest at play does not obviate the potential for for win-win partnerships as long as uh, uh, there's the sense of, 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 of all partners going into these engagements with, with eyes wide open. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, over here. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's, it's this again. Uh, thank you so much for the, these two presentations. Uh, there's, there's so much to talk about uh, that you both stimulated. But let me, let me restrict myself uh, to two issues. W one a question and, and then a comment that uh, I'd be very happy that you respond to. Uh, the, the question is about critical minerals. Uh, we, have, we have two parts of the world that have dealt with this in very different ways. I, I think China has done extraordinarily well over the last two decades around having the foresight of engaging the issues of critical minerals in the world. And right now, according to the Wilson Center report, China actually has 70% of the beneficiation chain, regardless of where the critical minerals are, are actually mined, which is a, a terrific place to be. But maybe, Professor Zhang, you, you may want to talk about how this too can be one of those buckets of cooperation with the Global South, uh, because this is where the critical minerals are. I can't imagine Europe going back to mining in Europe, for example. Um, and on the other hand, you have Africa that is way, way behind on this. This is where 60% of those critical minerals sit, both terrestrial and offshore, and we're not in the value chain. So, uh, Humphrey, maybe you want to comment on that around what we should be doing around an acceleration. The second, and, 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 and this is my comment, oh, and, and the other thing maybe, Professor Zhang, to say that much, much more needs to be done by both China and its partners around dealing with the bad press. So you have a Chinese intervention anywhere in the world, and it's called colonization. And interestingly enough, the people who lead that commentary are the people who've actually colonized us for centuries. Uh, we, we, we need to start organizing for a different narrative to empower the partnerships in much more concrete ways, and you may want to comment on that. M my own commentary is about this issue, about this debate that we're having in various parts of the world around whether or not we should have a transition. And, and Africa is one of those places. It's a bizarre discussion, actually, uh, because there aren't two options. The, the only discussion that is available is pace. How quickly are you going to get into the low carbon game? And this is about fundamental economic survival as, as a driver in many places. So for example, in South Africa, if South Africa, which is a major manufacturer of motor vehicles for the global market, if we don't switch from ICEs to EV, and maybe even beyond EV because there are other options, we will not have an export industry. So a big city like Nelson Mandela Bay would lose 60% of its revenue immediately. The whole province of the Eastern Cape would lose 40% of its jobs immediately. So there are those drivers. So, so one of the things that we did do uh, at 
the inaugural uh, African Climate Summit, uh, and thank you to to the government and people of Kenya for doing that for all of us, is that we talked about this notion of a new plan for the continent. Now, Professor Zhang Humphrey talked about uh, the the new Silk Road, if you like, uh, around BRI 2.0. And we started talking in September about Agenda 2063 2.0. Because Agenda 2063 counted on that $10 trillion asset, fossil fuel asset on the African continent to power it. That's no longer available. We're not going to be able to do that. So what is, what is the Africa's version of BRI 2.0 look like around Agenda 2063? And how can this South-South Alliance, because we have very powerful players in the South-South Alliance now, how can that South-South Alliance organize to become a serious club in the world around shifting that gear in Africa, in Latin America, as it's already actually happening in Asia. So, I mean, Asia has the benefit of two mega green-directed economies in China and India. So it has a lot more momentum, but clearly the other two places in the world would like to catch up. Chair, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any others? <coughs> Online? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, microphone. Thank you very much. The two papers deal one with the Chinese perspective on South-South cooperation in green technology, the other with the general framework. But I think one big issue that was one of the reasons that green technology came to the agenda was the need to get the northern countries to commit mm. to transfer green technology. Mm. It's supposed to be a, a part of the deal uh, in climate. I did not detect that uh, in, the, in the presentations, maybe it is on the papers or in other elaborations, and what the state of the art of that uh, element of the negotiations. Yes, I, I think it's a very important point, and I was waiting for that to surface, and it did not, and thank you very much for bringing it up. Uh, I think uh, when TRIPS uh, was ad adopted uh, in as a part of uh, the Uruguay Round Agenda and all, uh, the assurance was that TRIPS will facilitate transfer of technology. There is Article 7 explicitly, uh, uh, you know, explicitly saying that it would help to transfer of technology, but the provisions of transfer of technology in TRIPS agreement are very vague and left to be best endeavor clauses. And uh, uh, for last 30 years nearly, we haven't seen any progress on that. So what are we going to do with respect to access to technologies that are locked in the, uh, you know, with the global companies uh, and protected by uh, the patents or intellectual property rights and how do we access them in an affordable manner. That should be certainly one agenda on the table when we are talking of access to green technologies. So with that, uh, uh, we have uh, heard two very good presentations and a number of issues raised by uh, colleagues in the room. And I want to just check if anyone online uh, has any points to uh, two presenters. Any hands on the screen? No. Uh, so we, we so so in that case, I will turn to two presenters uh, first in the same order as they spoke. So first to Humphrey, and then to Professor Chang. So Humphrey, you have the floor. If you want to respond to. Yeah, very good comments um, uh, towards improving uh, the quality of the paper or the policy brief. Um, le 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 let me just uh, mention, um, I think, yeah, let me just, uh, yeah, okay. My order might uh, change, but let me just uh, see how well I can be able to 
uh, organize the flow of uh, my answer. Uh, there was a question on um, minerals. I think, yeah, actually two questions on minerals. Yeah, I, I know this question when it comes to these precious uh, minerals, it's a, it, actually it's a concern um, because you find that um, Africa is considered as a source of these materials, which are very key when it comes to designing and also assembling of uh, these these uh, products that we see, uh, amazing uh, you know products uh, that are going to be to be used later on. Um, you find that uh, our role actually is either we are just producers of uh, the raw materials, or at the consumer side. Eh? So I think yeah, but in between, when it comes to the production of that, you know the designing element, we are actually not there. So and I, I think this is a big big uh, concern, uh, which I think. Uh, um, I think the debate that uh, Alex you mentioned, I think we really need to, <laughs> we really actually need to see how well we can strategize, strategize ourselves and be on the table so that uh, we can uh, actually present our case. I think it's not too late. It can still happen uh, because I believe when you go and say, or oh, actually you're negotiating, I have all the resources and this is what uh, you know, I'm demanding, you know, demanding you to do. So I think it's possible. Um, but I think again, uh, connected to also to the pre previous uh, uh, questions on the same. So how firm can we be? How strategic can we do this? I think that's maybe the, the challenge that we need to uh, still again also uh, take to, especially our readers, before, because you find also the group or not, they're also able to play around with the, our readership. Yes, they know, I mean, it's real readers, they know the challenge, I mean, the good things of uh, localizing, you know, by putting up, you know, a plant to manufacture. Yet you also find that uh, they also are um, twisted and all that. So I think it's really uh, an aspect of, I think, also readership, uh, which uh, really I think we need to see how well we can even position ourselves. Now that now the South, you know, you know, with the, the group of South, we actually now, you know, becoming stronger. Maybe perhaps I think maybe the negotiation could also even now take that angle. So I, I know it's something that we need to really, we still need to see how well we can uh, position ourselves, position our argument, uh, strengthen our debate, and uh, make our position. I think it's it's doable, it's not too late. Uh, it can, we can actually be able to do uh, to do that. So yeah, I think this is maybe the question uh, uh, on the on the on the on this, and being ambitious. I know in the past uh, the continent has, has not been uh, very very ambitious, uh, and this is because uh, we only had some readers who actually benefited from such. So you find that uh, when readers are benefiting, majority are not benefiting, creating a few jobs, um, yet. There is potential to correct. I mean, to generate a lot of jobs. I think uh, really, uh, I think uh, there is a sense of uh, uh, that is actually coming to uh, to our leadership, and I think uh, uh, with maybe the brief, uh, we could try to see how well we can bring this aspect of uh, uh, leaders being engaged uh, correctly, making the correct position uh, in a very strategic way. Yeah, especially when it comes to relating with the other members in the South region. Now, um, there's also a question on um, um, jobs. I, I think, yeah, I don't know, yeah. Um, yes, I know um, with the transition, um, there are some changes that are going to be, to be, to be, to be experienced, both positive and, uh, uh, and negative. Um, we happen to, there's a study that I recently did on the EVs, electric vehicles in Kenya. Um, yeah, uh, and when look at the value chain approach, I can tell you um, the amazing things that uh, this, this, this uh, uh, you know, green technology can actually bring. Um, because at the moment, I look at, okay, I know Kenya is not, um, uh, a heavy manufacturer, or uh, we don't have a lot of a lot of plants when it comes to uh, vehicles uh, as compared to South Africa. But even the few ones that I have, I mean, we have. I looked at. We have only been able. I mean, we've, I think, employed not so many people. 
Um, but when I see with EVs, I'm seeing a whole sort of chain, right from, uh, uh, especially the ones who are, I, I know, okay, not everyone will really be able to, uh, to have a new EV. There is also that possibility, which I think is also happening, I think in India and all that, what we are calling it retrofit, retrofitting. So that means that uh, we're taking an old vehicle or a fossil fuel engine, converting it to be, uh, to be, to be electric. Uh, it's already an industry uh, in some countries, so it's something that uh, is also doable, um, which can also generate a lot of jobs. I think again also when it comes to, because you're also going to enhance electricity production, distribution, so definitely there will also be a lot of jobs. Again, there are also some uh, other supporting industry like IT, because these EVs, they are gradually driven by, you know, based on software. So again, you also find that uh, the software industry is also going to be generated. So I think for me, uh, in as much as you say there are some jobs that are going to be lo uh, lost, yes, very true. But again, also it's also an avenue of uh, now seeing uh, a whole new industries that are going to be created and uh, generate uh, uh, a lot of jobs. Um, but I think again, uh, yeah, it's something that you also need to uh, to approach uh, cautiously in a very um, a careful manner, so that again, uh, we are not uh, uh, putting uh, thousands or billions of people jobless. Yeah, I think it's something that also needs to be well planned, so that when people are, uh, actually they are moving from one uh, technology, it's also the, maybe the same people that are also going to be trained to go for the new, uh, for these new technologies. Um, last but not least, um, yeah, when it comes to, I think also that aspect of uh, um, having champions for Africa, I think it's also possible. Um, yeah, if we've seen in a few sectors already, uh, I, I think maybe for instance, if you look at uh, some uh, sectors like, uh, uh, I think in the digital economy, uh, ICT, um, developing countries, I think they're all standing strong dictating what is actually happening in the global sector, uh, that particular sector. So I think it's also the same thing can also happen. Uh, again, cultivate um, that, you know, the champions, local champions uh, of the, you know, global south and really, um, you know, um, drive the agenda. Um, it's very possible um, with leadership, with support, yeah, so that these people, when they go to meetings, when they go to, you know, to make representation, they are able to articulate the position of the Global South. I think it's possible to uh, to do that. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, I think those may be the main ones. Uh, and the last one, I think, uh, Prof. Kuma uh, has answered. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Humphrey. Uh, now, let me turn to Dr. Shang. Uh, uh, any responses you want to make? Again, we can't hear you. Uh, tech. Yes. Hold on. They're fixing. Okay. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. So, can you hear me now? Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. Okay, good. And first about this quick minerals. I'm not an expert in quick minerals. I'm more an agricultural expert. Uh, but um, according to my observation, you know, in Africa, I can say um, the growing ownership of African countries, you know, uh, in terms of controlling its natural resources. Um, and also um, the, the mode of cooperation. Um, you know, this, this is um, the changing landscape of uh, international development cooperation. We can see somebody call it the rise of global south. Uh, I can see the trend, you know, with um, uh, a new uh, modality of sub sub cooperation. Uh, I can see actually some partner countries have already been empowered. Um, and in terms of uh, critical minerals, you know, um, 
actually there are a lot of um, cases if you uh, dig into it uh, you you can say um, you know it's um, China's engagement with the local uh, partners is different from uh, uh, traditional donors uh, I think you know more uh, technology infrastructure uh, projects uh, were, were followed to tackle this kind of uh, gap um, and of course you know um, there are some problem problems uh, of the, the host countries um, in terms of capacity building or uh, development financing all those kind of issues so so that's that's my uh, observation and the second is about you know mm, yeah china's uh, dominant um, uh, expertise within China, if if you see China's global engagements, um, we, we can see actually most of China's um, international development cooperation is deeply embedded within China's uh, domestic uh, development experiences or, uh, you know, its domestic agenda. Um, within China, everybody is um, is talking about this kind of uh, green development. You know, uh, there is a very popular uh, uh, words shared by President Xi: "Green, um, uh, uh, we, uh, green mountain and lucid water are gold and silver." That means, you know, to protect uh, the environment, um, you know, is a way to uh, make you rich. So this this is um, a very uh, dominating narrative. Of course, huge um, resources has been invested in uh, green development um, of China, and um, uh, in terms of this kind of you know um, uh, uh, hydropower, EV, uh, all these kind of um, uh, key technologies. So, so this this is something I think uh, when you um, uh, observe China's behavior abroad, I think you need to pay close attention to China's domestic agenda and China's domestic experiences. Um, this is reflected uh, in it, following the same logic and showing the same feature. And the third one, uh, you know, uh, national interest. Um, I always think, you know, to talk about national interest, even uh, in the uh, aid projects, is is not a shame. Um, I'm sure many um, Western scholars they also share the same ideology, um, uh, because of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, mutual benefit uh, that that cooperation can be uh, uh, equal and. Uh, 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 can be sustainable. So, so, so that's um, the the if influence of South South cooperation. I think is that that that's. Um, but but how can make this kind of become equal is is very challenging. Um, uh, for example, you know, China is very big economy, right? Uh, Tanzania is small. Tanzania's total economy is just one. Um, is is even smaller than one province of uh, of Chinese Guangdong. So how can make this an equal partnership? Sometimes it's very difficult in reality. Um, so now um, what we we change um, some um, um, policies when we conduct cooperation with African countries. You know, without giving up the principle of reciprocity. Uh, we we usually call it, um, you know, giving uh, now, take later, or giving more, take le less. Uh, the, the, these kind of new narratives is coming um, with the China's uh, uh, position, uh, growing position. So so um, and someone call it diffused a reciprocity not means not immediate spontaneous reciprocity but i do think you know the reciprocity is key to maintain this kind of equal partnership uh, even 
you know, uh, yes, some reality. Um, it's it's not practical, but that's that's the design problem. It's not the the problem of the principle itself. And uh, yeah, and the the next one, uh, shall shall we have a serious, a uh, soft soft uh, alliance? Uh, if we trace back the history of South South Corporation, we can say, you know, uh, South South Corporation had been very weak over the last uh, 50 years from 1955 to um, early uh, 21st century. I think that the main problem is the, the weak position of um, its economic position uh, and also um, you know, um, the, 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 uh, the weak uh, uh, voice um, and fragmented um, uh, fragmentation of these South-South Corporation partners. Now, um, South-South Corporation is becoming uh, more important and getting attention because of the rise of the emerging economies. Um, uh, th th this this is something we cannot deny, uh, but we also need to know that the old um, challenge still exists, still there. That's the fragmentation um, of uh, uh, southern countries in terms of political, economic, um, all, all, all these uh, things. Uh, how can we establish a serious club? Uh, in the global south or or, or south or, or, or in the world um i don't know i don't know we we really need to think about this uh, issue collectively um and um, and to to be more inclusive you know not to just to exclude the traditional donors probably uh, i think many traditional donors started to accept uh, this kind of south south cooperation a modality, we should welcome them, I think, as long as they, 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 uh, they um, agree, right? It's, it's, um, it, if we think about the changing economic uh, scenario um, of uh, even some traditional donors, uh, and I think probably um, South-South cooperation, uh, principles of South-South cooperation um, will become more popular and um, su substantive. Uh, in the future, um, I I I I don't know if I addressed uh, all your questions. I I think I I should shut up and uh, um, to to hear more comments. Uh -huh. We have had a very rich uh, discussion of uh, issues and challenges that. Uh, global South countries, especially in, in Africa, face with respect to their green transition uh, because of uh, access to uh, green technologies and uh, uh, you know the other uh, you know sort of supplies of critical materials, raw materials included, and uh, how uh, China is trying to address that was the focus of uh, the presentation of Prof Professor Chang. But in this context, I want to also put on the table that uh, as a part of the T20 Task Force 2, uh, which was briefed uh, this morning, uh, I happen to be involved in preparing one policy brief uh, along with some partners, including uh, uh, Kevin Gallagher and uh, Rachel Thrasher from uh, Boston University Global Policy uh, uh, Global Develop uh, Global Development Policy Center. Uh, Elizabeth Sidiropoulos, uh, the uh, director of uh, SAIA, uh, and uh, Fajal Ismail uh, the, of uh, uh, Mandela Center in, in South Africa. So we have just submitted a very early draft, and we are hoping to get uh, some inputs and uh, comments on that. The essential point that we have made in that policy brief is that, uh, you know, Climate change, 
being a very sort of life and death question for the humanity. Uh, we need to, you know, sort of provide for some uh, options for exercising flexibility uh, with respect to intellectual property rights. And there is a precedence available. The precedence was that when HIV AIDS became a big challenge uh, in the beginning of this century, uh, the global uh, countries in, uh, in the WTO agreed to uh, putting aside uh, patents for, uh, you know, uh, life-saving drugs and medicines uh, with this statement called uh, TRIPS and Public Health, which you all of us know has been tremendous success of international cooperation. You know, that uh, the patents were put aside, which allowed uh, companies from the global south to produce generic versions of the known, uh, you know, drugs. And the cost of treatment per person came down from $20,000 per year per person, per patient, to just 200 or less uh, dollars per person, and it helped to contain the uh, the uh, disease, the HIV AIDS, and you hardly hear anything about HIV AIDS anymore. So much so, uh, in uh, my days, uh, the UN ASCAP, uh, which Jorge would also know, there was a UN agency created for dealing with HIV AIDS, uh, you know, UN AIDS, which was finding, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, no work uh, to deal with anymore. I mean, they were struggling for their existence because the, the problem which they were created for has really dissipated uh, because of the availability of cheap treatment. And so, now, if we could come together as a, you know, uh, humanity uh, to provide uh, and create an option for addressing the challenge of HIV AIDS, why not for climate change? Climate change is even more serious, I would say, uh, an issue or challenge that we are all facing than even HIV AIDS. Uh, of course, HIV AIDS in those days when uh, the world was confronting was a very major challenge. But today, I think there is nothing bigger uh, challenge than uh, the climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. And so in that context, the world needs to come together again to uh, resolve that, uh, you know, anybody who wants to make use of uh, the known technologies, why you want them to force into re reinventing the wheel? Use these technologies by all means and exercise the flexibility with respect to intellectual property rights, as we did in the context of uh, TRIPS and public health. So I think uh, there are those kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, I issues for international cooperation at north-south, south-south, and triangular, uh, which we'll, we need to exploit for addressing the grave uh, threat to the humanity that we are all facing. So on that note, I want to invite all of you to give them a very big hand to our two speakers for this session. And, and then I hand over to uh, uh, Alex and his team for any future agenda and announcements uh, beyond this t session. So this discussion is over. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. That is the audio coming through. Hello? Yep, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, uh, Professor Kumar, for your facilitation. Thank you for our speakers. Uh, we're, we've come to the end of a, of, a, of a long day. There's been a lot of content. I'm extremely pleased with uh, the level of discussion and engagement. Um, I am not going to even attempt to 
summarize um, some of the key points that came up, um, except to say that it was, uh, number one, very encouraging that we heard from uh, several people today, um, both from up here and in the audience, uh, remarking on, I think, the value of a forum and a process like this and the potential to, to drive forward this conversation. And secondly, I think very clearly uh, what we heard from representatives of the Brazilian government, uh, from representatives of the T20 and um, other speakers uh, is, is just the, the uh, importance of this moment um, to, um, uh, to drive an agenda forward, um, to strengthen Southern voices, uh, and that really, if we look at if we look at the series of G20 presidencies, if we look at COP30 coming up, um, this is really a a critical juncture uh, and something that we can truly truly build from. I want to remind everyone, uh, including our online audience, that we have another session tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's session will be a half day. Uh, and what we are going to be doing tomorrow, um, I hinted at it this morning, is zeroing in then a little bit more specifically on the South African and the Brazilian experience. Um, recognizing the fact that clearly these countries are, are quite different in terms of their energy mix and so, some of dynamics, but there are also commonalities. Um, some of the discussion is, I think, about further forging and strengthening those partnerships for lesson learning between the countries, but crucially also, uh, it's about those two countries as actors in the international system, as very prominent uh, voices um, furthering a global south agenda. So it's, in a sense, the two countries looking across the Atlantic perhaps at each other, but also looking outwards into the broader international, international system. So that's tomorrow's discussion. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to close today's session. We do have some refreshments. I think we all could do with a cup of coffee. Um, outside. Thank you to our um, online audience and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>